Now this might be the most indifferent I've ever felt towards a ship that we've covered. Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin and welcome back to my channel. Now I feel like it's been a while since I've given a synopsis on this series that I do. So if you're new here, welcome to my Love Story series. This is where I take a ship from a show or movie series and cover their entire timeline from start to finish. Today we are going to be covering the beloved Jesse and Tony from the Disney Channel series Jesse. And while I personally don't really have much of an emotional attachment to this ship today, I know a lot of you guys do. And so with all that being said, let's just jump right into it. So our first episode begins and we are introduced to our main character, Jessie. She has just moved from Texas to New York to pursue her dream of being an actress. But when she is unable to pay for her taxi, she ends up getting thrown out of the cab and that is where our story begins. Jessie lands in front of the Fairfield residence and their doorman, Tony, runs to help her up. He jokes that she must be a bad tipper and then she looks back at him with hearts in her eyes. Whoa, you must be a really bad tipper. I'm Tony. I'm Jessie. And I'm guessing this is yours. <laughs> so as far as meet cutes go, this one isn't exactly my favorite, but it's also definitely not the worst that I've seen. My main critique would be that it is quite short, but it is still sweet and shows that Jesse is smitten by him right off the bat. And I do feel like the subtleness of it does get you intrigued for what's to come. So obviously if you've seen the show before, you would know that that little girl was Zuri and she ends up recruiting Jesse to become the nanny for her and her siblings. Shenanigans then ensue and Jesse ends up losing Losing the kids in the first episode. So she goes to Tony and he's able to use the security cameras to figure out that the kids are on the roof and in their dad's helicopter. We also see Tony again near the end of the episode when Jesse is disappointed that she can't reach the kids' parents. Tony then says that it's too bad that she doesn't know how to fly a helicopter and then is shocked when she reveals that she actually can. She decides to use the helicopter to fly to where they are and he tosses her the keys as she leaves. So as far as first episodes go, it's definitely not much in regards to ship content but at the same time, that's not exactly what this show is about, and so I'm not mad at it. But I am glad to see Tony included from the very beginning, as it hints at what's to come and also does a good job at building their foundation. He's also featured in the second episode, where we, again, don't exactly see much of him, but he does help Jesse and the kids hide Mrs. Kipling from Mrs. Chesterfield. Mrs. Kipling is the giant lizard that one of the kids, Ravi, keeps as a pet, and Mrs. Chesterfield is the head of the condo board and also owns the building, and so she'll become more relevant as our story continues. Moving on to episode three, which is when we get our first Tessie-centric episode. We begin with Tony gifting Jessie a welcome basket. It includes subway maps, pepper spray, and a metro card. She jokes about the pepper spray being in case she's a victim of assault, and then he laughs at this. And I think overall this gesture is really sweet. So far we've only seen Jessie show any interest in him with that look that she gave him in the first episode, and so him doing all of this for her I feel like is a great way for them to hint at him maybe reciprocating those feelings. This later brings us to a conversation between Jesse and Emma, who is another one of the Ross children. Jesse says that the basket was nice and then Emma teases her about him being in love with her. She then brings her attention to her magazine as proof, which lists gift giving and laughing at her jokes as signs. But Jesse says that even if Tony does like her, she's not going to date him. And this is because she's learned to never date someone that you work with. Emma teases her by asking if this is because she got her heart broken by a rodeo clown. And Jesse begrudgingly says yes, but also explains how the previous summer she worked at a restaurant and everything was fine until she broke it off with the assistant manager. And so this is good, this I really like. We've got some conflict and also a good reason as to why they can't be together. And so, so far I am on board. The following day, Emma freaks out about Tony being in the lobby and uses her magazine once again to try and gauge to see if he likes her. She tells Jesse that if he touches her shoulder to elbow, then he likes her as a friend. Elbow to wrist is the transitional zone and wrist to fingertips means that he wants to hold her hand, which is of course the romance zone. And so then Jesse jokes that as long as he doesn't try to touch her end zone. And then this, along with so many other jokes that they included in the show, were actually a bit shocking to me. I really didn't realize that they included so many jokes in this show for the parents. And it's crazy for me to think about just like how many of those jokes went right over my head as a kid. Entering the lobby, Tony is excited to show Jesse the new addition to his uniform, which are his epaulets. Emma then pulls Jesse aside, telling her that upgrading his outfit is sure sign number four. But Jesse is still unsure, calling his epaulets not an upgrade, but instead something that makes him look like he's guarding the Wizard of Oz. Which was honestly a little bit heartbreaking to hear as we come to learn just like how much Tony loves his epaulets. Anyways, he offers to help her with her bags and Emma pulls her aside once again, this time freaking out about him going straight to her hands and calling him a zone skipper. She tells Emma to relax 
relax and that it's not like he's asking her out, which is clearly a setup to the following line where Tony asks Jessie if she wants to have lunch tomorrow in the park. Jessie is unsure and so Emma answers for her saying that she'd love to. Hey Jessie, wanna have lunch in the park tomorrow? <laughs> well, she'd love to. Right, Jessie? <laughs> I would love to, but I can't miss hangar day. <laughs> You're excused. Awesome. See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So again, I like all of this. I like seeing Jesse being a bit apprehensive in regards to going out with him, and then having Emma pressuring her into it, I feel like makes for an interesting dynamic. Moving on to right before their date, where we see that Jesse has her own plans in mind, as she comes down in sweats asking how she looks. Zuri jokes that she looks like Cinderella before the transformation, and Jesse says that that's perfect. She's hoping that this outfit will make Tony see her as one of the guys, and won't lead to him asking her out again. But Emma argues that no matter how badly she dresses, Tony is still going to try and kiss her and then they're going to start dating. Jessie says that knowing her history, they'll then end up having a hideous breakup and then she'll end up having to take the stairs to avoid him in the lobby. Zuri asks if this means that she doesn't like him at all and questions if she's seen his new epaulets and Jessie says that they're lovely but she's not getting involved with him. Or his sparkly blue eyes or his perfectly full lips that make her melt like butter. She then has to splash a cup of water in her face to snap herself out of it. Yes, Zuri, and they're lovely but I'm not getting involved with him. Or his sparkling blue eyes. Or those perfect full lips that just make a gal melt like butter on hot Texas asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> So what can I say, I like this all as well. Especially here because so far we've seen her be nothing but against the idea of going on a date with him. And so this was a fun way to remind us that she is actually interested in him and so all of this has just been her overcompensating. But now let's get to their date in Central Park. So Tony brings a bunch of home cooked Italian food to their date. Jesse cracks a joke and then he laughs calling her one funny girl. And then Jesse is upset with herself for charming him with her sparkling wit. He then pulls out a baguette and she tries to turn him off with her eating grabbing it and ripping off a piece as she sits on the top part of the bench. He is impressed, saying that he's never seen a girl eat like that before, and then she tells him to just think of her as one of the guys as she hits him on the shoulder. He then admits that she's the prettiest guy he's ever seen, except for Zac Efron. Whoa, I've never seen a girl eat like that. So my Aunt Sophia, she can unhinge her jaw like an anaconda. <laughs> wow, well, just think of me as one of the guys. You're the prettiest guy I ever saw. Except for Zac Efron. I'd have to call that a jump ball. So a very sweet moment. I like how no matter how hard Jesse tries, he still sees her as cute. And then also the lack of toxic masculinity with his Zac Efron comment was a nice touch as well. Moving on to the end of the episode where we see the couple run into the lobby for shelter from the rain. Jesse is wearing his jacket and he jokes about it being a good thing that he found the umbrella he's holding. She reminds him that he didn't find it but instead stole it from a hot dog cart. Tony then says genuinely that he had a great time today and Jesse thinks about Emma saying that Tony's going to try and kiss her. She then panics about what she said about having to avoid him in the lobby if they break up and about her history dating someone that she works with. So she's going through all of this as he leans in, which causes her to panic and pepper spray him. He yells at her, asking her why she did that, and she says that she's just trying to keep things from being awkward between them. No! Ah! Mace in the face! Why did you do that? Because I'm trying to keep things from being awkward between us. The only thing that can make it more awkward is if I lost a limb. And she argues that he's been trying to get with her all day. He brought her on a romantic picnic, said that she was one of the two prettiest guys that he'd ever seen, and then he tried to kiss her. But he excuses all of this, saying that the picnic was leftovers from his mother's poker game, the Zac Efron comment wasn't exactly a compliment, and that he was just leaning in to get his jacket. So Jesse, now embarrassed, takes the jacket off, handing it back to him, before admitting that this is awkward. She then asks why he invited her out if he doesn't want to kiss her, and he explains because she's new in town and doesn't have any friends, which now he understands why. And once again, I feel like this episode is a goodie because I like all of this as well. This is one situation where I feel like the miscommunication trope is actually used correctly, and I also feel like it does a good job of creating doubt in the viewer. Because if all that he's been saying here is true, then why did he give her his jacket? And spend all that time making her that welcome basket. 
I just have to call Tony's bluff on this one, but all will be revealed soon. Upstairs, Emma asks Jesse how her date went and teases her about smelling romance, but Jesse says that there is no romance with Tony and there never will be. And then Emma is shocked that her magazine got it wrong, or did it, as we then come to see a conversation between Tony and Zuri. Tony admits that the whole day he was trying to be just friends with Jesse, but then she just looked so pretty with the raindrops in her hair that he did lean in for a kiss. But then he got pepper sprayed. He explains that he tried to play it off like he was just reaching for his jacket, but it was really awkward. He then asks her what he should do, but she doesn't know or care. So, the whole day, I, I was just trying to be friends, you know? But then, Jessie looked so pretty with the raindrops in her hair. I went in for a kiss, and then BAM! She pepper sprayed me! <laughs> tried to play it off like I was just reaching for my jacket, but it was really awkward. Now talk about a great moment to wrap up a great episode. This confirmation from Tony was so necessary, and I feel like it adds so much more nuance to their story. And so, so far, I don't have any complaints. I think having them do the long game is a great start, and at this point, I'm just excited to see where the relationship goes. A couple episodes later, we see Tony helping Jesse with the kids once again. Basically, Jesse and Luke, who was another one of the kids, there are four in total, but they end up getting discovered by what they think is a big time producer. But in reality, he's a scam artist who already scammed Tony in the past. So he runs down to the recording studio and barges in, and then goes on to reveal the guy's true intentions. This results in Tony making a video for them instead, which Jessie says is awesome. And then afterwards, she tells the kids that she's going up to her room. And then all of them, along with Tony, say that they want to go with her. Then after she leaves, he jokes with Luke that you can't blame a guy for trying. So a little bit of a not so subtle moment in comparison to what we've previously seen from Tony. But I don't mind it as I do understand that it was a very of its time comment to make, and I understand that it was just supposed to be a joke. In episode 9, Jessie gets a date with the famous heartthrob who is staying with them, and so she comes into the lobby dressed for her date, and Tony is shocked. He tells her that she looks beautiful, asking if she's going to a funeral or something, and she admits that she has a date with Rufus T. Firefly, which is the guy's alias. Tony is shocked again, asking why she's going out with him, as the disguise that he was wearing kind of made him look homeless. They then get interrupted by a crowd of fans, and Jessie makes her escape but then things really kick into full gear in episode 13. We start the episode off with Tony showing Jesse and the kids his new dolly and how he can ride it. He then asks Jesse if she wants to have an apple as he pulls one out. She thanks him and says that she will enjoy its linty goodness. And then in comes Tony's competition as a guy on a bike interrupts. Jesse comments on him being cute before he introduces himself to her. He then continues to flirt with her while Tony looks upset. The mystery man then leads Jesse inside while Zuri stresses to Tony that he's stealing his woman and his job. She pressures him to do something, and so he runs over to open the other door, but this just results in him hitting her in the face. In the lobby, this new guy Brody invites Jesse to dinner tomorrow night. Zuri then cuts in, saying that she can't, as that's her bedtime, but Jesse just asks if later works so that she can put Zuri to bed and then go out with him. Brody agrees to this and then gives her a rose before leaving. Tony is then disappointed by this entire interaction, and then after she leaves, we see him throw his apple in the garbage. The following day, Zuri tells Tony that he has to tell Jesse that he likes her before Brody gets here. But he tells her that he can't compete with him, listing off that he's rich while he's poor, and he rides a motorcycle while he rides a dolly. But Zuri just argues that him and Jesse are meant for each other and are going to live happily ever after. And then this is a particular frustration that I have with this couple. Throughout their story, this argument is often used by Emma and Zuri, that these two characters are just meant for each other and that's just how it's supposed to be. And I understand that they're children and so that's oftentimes the only explanation that they need, but I just feel like that's such a cop-out reason. It almost reminds me of Cory and Topanga from Boy Meets World, as they would often use the same reasoning as to why they should be together as well. Whereas I just personally don't feel like that's a compelling enough reason. Don't just tell me that these characters are supposed to be together and leave it at that. I want genuine reasons as to why these two are good for each other. What is it about Tony that makes Jesse a better person and vice versa? And what is it about their connection that makes it so special? I wish they could have showcased more the why to these questions throughout their story, instead of them just saying that they're supposed to 
end up together and just leaving it at that. Because honestly, that's just not good enough for me. I'm sorry. Anyways, Tony thanks her for saying that, but feels as though guys from his neighborhood don't get happy endings. And this is what sparks an idea for Zuri. So we get to her bedtime and Zuri decides to tell Jesse a story instead. She creates this whole medieval narrative where she repeats what we saw in the beginning of the episode. But of course, in her version, Jesse ends up with Tony instead. We then end the episode with everyone finding out that Brody is actually a two-timer thanks to Bertram. The kids confront him along with Tony who says that he's not good enough for Jesse. That she's smart, pretty, nice, and always smells really good, comparing her to a fancy air freshener. He finishes by saying that Jesse is great and he's a piece of moldy lasagna. And so of course, Jesse overhears all of this. You, you're the problem. You don't deserve a girl like Jesse. She's smart and pretty and nice, and she always smells really, really good. Like one of those fancy air fresheners you plug into an outlet of the wall. <laughs> My point is, <laughs> Jesse's great, and you're a piece of moldy lasagna. And now this is all great. Another one of my favorite tropes is seeing one of them complimenting the other while unaware that the other is actually listening in. And then also getting to see him be all protective of her was sweet as well. Brody then begrades Tony by calling him a doorman and says that what matters is Jesse thinks that he's great. And now it's Jesse's turn to stand up for Tony. So she chimes in saying that that doorman's name is Tony. And that even though he rides a dolly and gives out linty apples, he's more of a gentleman than he will ever be. She then kicks him out, grabbing him by the shoulder and escorting him to the elevator. Jesse then thanks Tony for sticking up for her and says that he smells nice too, kinda lemony. He thanks her and then admits that it's furniture polish. He then says that he was wondering if, and she finishes his sentence saying that she would love to go out with him. He is shocked and then admits that that was easier than he thought it would be. So Jesse, I was maybe wondering if you want to... I would love to go out on a date with you, Tony. You would? Ah, huh. that was easier than I thought. So honestly, despite this episode having its moments, I don't love it as being the one that gets these two together. I feel like this asking out scene was a bit lackluster, and I don't understand why we had all of this buildup and anticipation set towards them in the earlier episodes, just for it to happen so easily, I feel like, in this one. However, I do think that they realize that that was a mistake that they made in this one, which is why we later see them continue trying to drag them out. And speaking of them dragging it out, let's get to their first failed date attempt. So in episode 16, Tony tells Jesse that for their date tonight, he's thinking dinner, a movie, and a carriage ride through Central Park. She says that the carriage ride sounds romantic before they are interrupted by the kids. Then shenanigans of the episode ensue and Jesse ends up glued to Mrs. Chesterfield. Tony then comes to the rescue with his mom's secret recipe to loosen anything. And while waiting for the solvent to work, Jesse says that tonight should be fun. He agrees saying that they missed their dinner reservation, but he says that they can still make the movie, commenting on how much he loves rom-coms. Jesse says that she does too and then goes on about the movie before they are interrupted by Mrs. Chesterfield. She hopes that they have a wonderful future together, which includes the two of them in an RV that ends up falling off a cliff. Instead of taking offense to this though, the couple just ends up gushing over how much they both love RVs. Anyways, Tony's solvent works and the couple goes to leave, but Mrs. Chesterfield won't let them until they find out who's guilty of all of this. Later, Jesse and the kids get Tony to review the security cam footage to prove their innocence. And when we cut to this scene, Jesse has has a rose in her hand. So I assume that there was a cute moment in there that was unfortunately cut. But we do end up finding who the culprit was and as predicted, it was none of the children. We then end the episode with this scene on the balcony between the couple. Jesse apologizes for making them miss their third first date and understands if he'd rather date someone with a more normal schedule. But Tony argues that he doesn't wanna date someone normal, he wants to date her. Jesse says that maybe someday they'll be able to catch a romantic moment. And he says her name, leaning in closer, telling her not to move. He then hits her in the face and shows her the mosquito that he just killed. Maybe someday we'll be able to catch a romantic moment somewhere. Jesse, don't move. <laughs> Tony, ow! Mosquito. Got it! <laughs> so something in particular that I wanted to take note of is that Jesse calls this their third first date attempt. But if you're keeping score, which I am, this is actually their second. The first being the pepper spray incident. And at first I thought that this was just a plot hole, but then I decided to look up the production order. And it explains that this episode was actually produced later, which explains the slip up here. But inconsistencies aside, I did really enjoy this moment. His slight diss with calling her not normal was quite funny to me. And then him hitting her 
her this time before an almost kiss was a nice callback to when she pepper sprayed him. And I kind of wish that this gag could have been continued throughout their relationship. I think it's funny and it reminds me of the Zedison punch from Zombies. But at the same time, maybe it is good that it ended here because I could also see that getting annoyingly repetitive. We then end up getting another failed date attempt in episode 19, but to talk about it, I kind of have to give some exposition. So in a previous episode, we met the evil Agatha. She was an antagonist to Jessie and she tried to blast her online for being a bad nanny. So in this episode, we meet her twin sister, Angela. She appears at first to be a lot nicer than Agatha, but we later come to find out that that's far from true. Nonetheless, Jesse introduces her to Tony, and then he asks Jesse, who has two thumbs and is looking forward to their date tonight. Jesse laughs hysterically at this and then asks him what he has planned. He says that it's a secret, but then on a totally unrelated note, asks what bowling shoe size she is. And now this is the first mention of bowling in regards to Tony, which I feel like later becomes a very big part of his character, which I liked as I did think that it suits him and I always love some bowling representation. The following day, Tony tells Jesse that he has good news and bad news. She asks to hear the good news first, but then he admits that it's really just bad news, as he has to take a rain check on their date tonight. She asks why, and he explains that Angela asked him to help her pick up her stuff, that apparently she can't pay to have it stored there anymore, and so they're going to throw it all out tomorrow. He also says that she told him that Jesse would be okay with it. Jesse is surprised that she said that, but then tells him to go for it after he goes on about how kind and understanding Angela said she is. And then we get to Angela trying to take over Jesse's job as nanny of the Ross children. This leads to the two of them getting into a fight at the spa. Tony runs in on this and comments on how adorable Jesse looks even when squished. Then while trying to break up their fight in the mud bath, he gets pulled in. Later, Jesse asks the kids to hug her for choosing her over Angela. The girls say that they're good as she's covered in mud, but Luke says that he's going for it along with Tony. So we have another somewhat creepy moment from the guys here. And this is another situation where I feel like I have to remind myself that this show is over 10 years old. And I know that these two examples really weren't that bad, but there were much worse moments in the series with Luke's character in particular, like the numerous times that they mentioned that he has set up a camera in Jesse's room. And this isn't me trying to say that we need to cancel Jesse for these jokes that were made forever ago, but just commenting on the ones that made me uncomfortable is all. Anyways, it is time Time for the couple's first date and also maybe first kiss. So we start off with Emma telling Tony that she can't believe him and Jesse are finally going out on their first date. She asks him if he's nervous, but he isn't as this is their fourth first date attempt. He then goes over each of them, the pepper spray, the gluing, and the mud, which causes him to conclude that maybe he should be nervous. Zuri then tells him not to worry as fourth time's the, and then Emma finishes by saying the time that nobody goes to the hospital. Emma then tells him to remember that girls love a gentleman and that he should offer her his coat if she she gets cold, and then Tony asks what happens if he gets cold. Zuri retorts that he can either be comfortable or in a relationship, but he can't have both. And despite this funny moment, I did find this conversation to be a bit interesting. We already saw that on their first date, he did give her his jacket, and so I don't think that he really needed this advice. Jesse then enters with a gift bag, wishing him a happy fourth first date. Tony apologizes for not getting her anything, but she tells him not to worry about it, as it's just something little that she made. She then pulls out a very thick scarf, and Tony is shocked, admitting that no girl has ever skinned a coyote for him before. She explains that it's a scarf. She then puts it on him and begins to clap, celebrating how great it looks. Tony then uncomfortably says that he loves it, asking if it's wool, then admits that he's allergic to wool as he gets stiffly and passes out. The next day, Jesse tells Tony that she's glad that the doctor said that he's okay, and he agrees, admitting that it's a weird feeling when your neck is bigger than your head. Jesse then has a confession to make, admitting that she's a jinx when it comes to dating. He says that he doesn't believe that, causing Emma and Zuri to list off all of her dating mishaps. And then Jessie says that her worst date of all was her senior prom. But when asked what happens, she says that they don't speak of it. This causes Emma to suggest that she might have better luck if the two of them plan their date. The couple agrees to this, and then the girls get to work. Onto their date, we see Tony show up in a bright blue suit, and Emma asks what he's wearing. He calls it his uncle's favorite threads, and the girls are unimpressed. Zuri then plays the role of Jessie's dad, going on to ask him various overprotective questions questions before Jesse enters in a ball gown. Tony is speechless and says that she looks wow, and Jesse says that he looks pretty wow himself before she makes her way downstairs. Wow. You look wow. <laughs> you look pretty wow yourself. And very blue. <laughs> And I'm sorry, but I feel like it just has to be said that that dress that she's wearing 
hideous. I feel like even back then it was hideous, but maybe that was the point as it does go well with the ugly suit. So Emma gives him a corsage to give to Jesse. He is unsure of what it is, announcing that he got her a flower in a to-go box. Emma tells him to pin it on her, but then he just ends up poking her repeatedly with it, and so she decides to hold it instead. She then asks that they finally tell them where they're going, and Emma leads her to the balcony. We then see that the girls decked it out in a under the sea theme, and Emma welcomes Jesse to her do-over prom. Tony says that it's awesome, but Jesse is not as impressed. She then starts to feel sick and begins dry heaving before leaving to throw up. In the kitchen, the girls apologize for upsetting her, and Jesse reveals that her prom was a very traumatic experience. She then tells the story about how she did the electric slide right into the electric eel tank and was humiliated. And all her date did was take a photo of her, laugh at her, and then never speak to her again. Her photo also lived on in the yearbook as she was voted class clownfish. Afterwards, Emma tells her not to give up and that Tony isn't like that and he would never laugh at her. She then says that waiting for her out there is a really awesome guy in a very terrible tuck. Jesse agrees and says that she's going out there to have fun. Back outside, Tony gushes over how the girls went all out. They then look through the telescope and Jesse notes that they got a beautiful night for their fifth first date. Tony agrees, saying that they actually got through it this time without anyone getting hurt, perfectly teeing up them noticing Ravi and Luke trapped in a billboard featuring a giant teacup. Jesse and Tony run to save them and she thanks the girls for a magical evening. So Tony climbs in to save the kids and Jesse tells him to hurry. He argues that he can't because if he ruins his uncle's suit, then he'll kill him, and Jesse jokes about looking forward to meeting his family. Tony tells Jesse to hold on to his waist and he'll lean in and pull the kids up, but then Bertram, who is also trapped in the teacup with them, wants out first. And then he ends up pulling Tony in as well. Jesse is upset, telling him that when she told him to get a grip, she didn't mean on her prom date, and Tony tells her that it's okay as he didn't get hurt. Jesse then gets Tony to put the kids on his back so that she can haul them out. They are successful, and then Bertram helps Tony out. But then when they're trying to get Bertram out, out, they end up falling in the teacup with him. So then they're trying to hoist Bertram out of the cup when Tony asks Jesse if he's told her that she looks really pretty. She then jokes that the butler on her head really sets off the dress. Bertram is then able to hoist himself out, and Jesse says that she can't believe another one of their dates got ruined. Tony asks if this is even worse than her prom disaster, but she says no, but that that date ended with her all wet and her date laughing so hard that he wet himself. Tony then calls that guy a jerk with bladder control issues. She laughs and he tells her to look commenting on how they're finally alone together, and that there's no way she can get soaked from all the way up here. Then as if on cue, the teapot on the billboard sprays water all over her. Jesse is furious by this, yelling at the universe, asking where the octopus is. Tony tells her to calm down, but she says that she can't. She then apologizes and admits that she just really likes him and wanted this night to be perfect. Tony then puts his jacket over her and tells her that it is. She then asks why he's not laughing at her as she looks ridiculous, but he says that she does and that she looks beautiful. She doesn't believe him, scoffing that she looks a mess, but then he leans in and kisses her. She then jokes to make that a hot mess. Why are you not laughing at me? You look ridiculous. No, you don't. You look beautiful. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm a mess. Make that a hot mess. <laughs> So as far as first kisses go from Disney Channel, I do really like this one. And as this is our last Tessie episode from this first season, it's made me come to realize that I did enjoy the couple in the beginning of the series. I feel like it was fairly simple, sweet, and the pacing was solid. Are they the best ship of all time? I mean, not in my own personal opinion. I feel like they lack a certain spark that would make them stand out in comparison to the others. But as far as the ship that was needed for this show, I feel like they were fine and it worked. Now to talk about their kiss, I absolutely love that he gave her his jacket. It brings me right back to when she had it on their first failed date, and when Zuri and Emma told him to do so at the beginning of the episode. I also found him complimenting her to be so sweet and genuine, and it was honestly just the perfect moment to replace a bad memory for Jesse. So Emma and Zuri see the couple kiss through the telescope and call Tony, and Emma tells him to ask her to dance to the music that she's playing through her phone. He does just that, and then they slow dance in the teacup. Ravi also chips in by using a a flashlight to create some mood lighting for them. Jesse says that this is the best fifth first date and do-over prom ever. He agrees, saying that they had a few bumps in the road, but they're together and his uncle's suit is still intact. And honestly, this episode might break the record for setups, as right after he says this, the teacup sprays them once again. She worries that his uncle is going to kill him, but he says it's okay as he'll die happy, pulling her back into their dance. Yeah, we had a few bumps in the road, but we're together and hey, 
Uncle Joey's suit still looks sharp. <laughs> Uncle Joey's gonna kill you. It's okay. I'll die happy. <laughs> so a nice moment to wrap up this episode as well as their entire arc from this season. I feel like it's also worth noting that the teacup that they're in is an advertisement for Tipton Tea, which is obviously a reference to the show that Debbie Ryan previously starred in. But moving on to season two, we begin with the season's Halloween episode. And while Tony is in the episode, I wouldn't say that we exactly get much ship content. Basically, Tony gets booked to work a Halloween party, and so he invites Jesse as his date. She tells him that she has an awesome flapper costume that she's going to wear, but Tony doesn't know what that is. She teases that all he needs to know is that it involves her wearing a short skirt, and then he is sold. He also later comes to Jesse for help after he spilled all of the punch for the party, but Jesse has fallen asleep at her desk, and so he has to wake her, which results in her smacking him in the face. She then helps him make punch, and it's like this whole thing where they think that Jesse has gone crazy and is trying to kill the kids. But as far as cute moments between the couple goes, that's basically it for this episode and it's time to move on to our next chapter. Moving on to our next episode where we get another appearance of Jealous Tony. We begin with Jesse and Tony on a movie date in the park. She comments on how romantic it is and leans in for a kiss before they are interrupted by Officer Petey. So Petey is this goofy cop who is somewhat friends with Jesse, and he at first thinks that Tony is another one of the Ross children before Jesse introduces him as her boyfriend. And so it's fun to know that they're using those labels already. Tony then tries to get rid of him by saying that the movie's starting, but Petey just takes this as an invitation separating the couple and sitting between them to watch. After their date, we see Jesse and Petey galloping back to their building, as well as an angry Tony carrying their picnic supplies behind them. They both laugh and gush over the movie before Tony interrupts, saying that he doesn't get it. They think that he's referring to the joke, and so they repeat it, but Tony explains that he was referring to not understanding why Petey is still there when he's supposed to be on the clock. Instead of answering this question, though, Petey just suggests that they try his improv class. Jesse excitedly says that she'd love that, and that they're going to have so much fun. She then hugs Petey and goes to the elevator before Tony asks if she's forgotten about him. She then apologizes and goes back to him, thanking him for their date. And now I do like that this one moment seems to fix everything for Tony here, as we do see him smile after this. The next day, Tony asks Emma if she's noticed that Jesse has been spending a lot of time with Petey. She tells him to relax, as Petey's not interested in Jesse, and then says that she's surprised that he is, asking if he's seen the way that she eats barbecue. But then this just transports Tony into dreamland land as he says that he sure has. She tells him that he doesn't have anything to worry about, but that she can do some snooping around for him if he'd like. Even offering to read her diary for him and he thanks her for this. Which is like, whoa, definitely our first big red flag. I'm honestly surprised that Tony agrees to her doing this without a second thought, as it is obviously a huge breach of trust and invasion of her privacy. Moving on though, when Jesse gets home from improv, Tony pages Emma asking that she find out if she's in love with Petey yet. So when Jesse arrives, Emma pulls her to the couch and tries to make this whole analogy with how Tony is feeling and with shoes, but Jesse doesn't really catch on. And so this is just some further demonstration of some toxic behavior from Tony. And I feel like the fact that he's getting a literal child to do his bidding for him doesn't help the situation either. Later that day, we see Tony ask Jesse to go to the movies with him later. She says that she'd love to, but she can't as she has her first improv performance. He then asks if Petey's gonna be there and she says, of course. And then he stops her from leaving saying that he wants to come too. She thanks him, but admits that this is her first time in front of an audience and so she's nervous. And she'd rather wait till she's better for him to come and watch. Later. Oh, I'd love to, but I can't tonight. I'm doing my first ever improv performance. Oh, is Petey going to be there? Of course. Then I want to come. Oh, thanks, but it's my first time in front of an audience and I'm already kind of nervous. I I'd rather wait until I'm better for you to come. Thank you for understanding. And while this may seem suspicious from Tony's perspective, I feel like this is a very valid request from Jessie, and it's nice to see her communicate very clearly what she wants. So Tony asks Emma if she saw that and concludes that she obviously prefers a man in uniform. Emma retorts that he's in a uniform as well, and Tony is shocked by this revelation. And I feel like while we were kind of hinting at it in the previous season, this is our first real example of Tony being not exactly the brightest. And while I usually don't like this stupid character trope, especially not when it gets worse throughout the course of 
of the series. For some reason, I don't really mind it in regards to Tony or their relationship. I feel like Jesse is always happy to correct him when he's wrong or explain things that he doesn't understand. Maybe she finds it charming, I don't exactly know. Anyways, we then see Emma continue with her stellar advice, as she says that if he really wants to know what they're up to, then she should sneak into their performance to see how they act when he's not around. He's unsure as Jesse told him not to come, but then she just yells at him that he shouldn't care what she says as she's cheating on him. Then says just kidding before adding probably. He then agrees that they should go and that is exactly what they do. And I feel like this is just like talk about the blind leading the blind. Emma is like the worst person that he could have gone to in this situation. At the theater, we see Tony and Emma in disguises. Emma is bored as they're just doing improv and it's not romantic or funny. But then Petey says that he likes Jesse's spacesuit as a part of their scene. This causes Tony to get upset saying that he can't talk to her like that. Emma wants to leave, but Tony says that he's staying as he needs to make sure that no funny business happens. For their last scene, Petey asks for an occupation and Tony yells back, girlfriend stealing cop. Petey and Jesse go on to do the scene and then Tony takes this as confirmation of his suspicions. He tells Emma that he told her he's a snake, but she retorts that they're only doing what he suggested. Nonetheless, Tony has had enough once Jesse's character says that he's making her forget all about her boyfriend. Tony then stands up loudly asking for a body part suggestion. The audience yells face, and so Tony throws his takeout food in Petey's face. Jesse is shocked, not by what he's done, but by the fact that they're not allowed to use props. Afterwards, Tony apologizes to Jesse for ruining her show. She says that she's still mad at him, and he says that she has every right to be, but then explains that her and Petey have so much in common that it made him feel left out. Nonetheless, he still can't believe he let his jealousy get the best of him and calls that stupid. She agrees that it was before admitting that she loved it, and that nobody has ever violently noodled someone for her before. He tells her that she's the best and jokes that it's not like Petey's going to be hanging around them all the time. And then of course we pan to Petey leaning against the wall, agreeing with them. I can't believe I let my jealousy get the best of me. That, that was so stupid. That was stupid. And I loved it. No guy has ever violently noodled somebody for me before. <laughs> You're the best, Jesse. And it's not like Petey's always gonna be hanging around, right? Right. <laughs> so I guess that we can conclude that Tony isn't the only toxic one here. Jesse saying that she loved his fit of jealousy I feel like was a little bit of a red flag for me, but I feel like in a weird way this kind of cancels one another out. Like if they're both going to be problematic, at least they can be problematic together. So Tony asks Petey if there's any hard feelings, and he says no as improv is a dangerous business. He then tells Jesse that she should keep doing improv and promises not to get jealous again, but then she finds out that the board did not accept her application to join. After he leaves, Tony gets upset with himself for getting her kicked out of the class, but she tells him that it's okay, and that at least now she has more time to spend with her favorite guy. This angers Tony as he asks who this new guy is and saying that he'll pound him like a cutlet, and then she calls him a dope, informing him that she was talking about him. He then calms down, blaming it on his stupid jealousy again, and asks if she'll forgive him if he takes her out for a nice dinner. She then uses her improv skills to say yes and, and then he adds buy her flowers and take her on a carriage ride through Central Park. She says that he's forgiven, leans in for a kiss, until Petey runs back in announcing that he loves carriage rides. Yes, and? Buy you flowers. Yes, and? Take you for a carriage ride around the park. Yes, and? And if this doesn't end soon, I'm gonna have to take out a loan. <laughs> You're forgiven. Oh, I love carriage rides! <laughs> I call shotgun, come on. <laughs> So a nice happy ending to a bit of a questionable episode. Don't get me wrong, I did enjoy it and I do think that it was a funny episode and I always love seeing Joey Richter, but there were definitely some red flags here, which I feel like was a first for the couple. Jumping to episode seven, which is when we see the couple next. And this is also when we get some more conflict. We start off with Jesse greeting Tony in the lobby with a hug. He then tells her that he made Tessie t-shirts for them and she is confused, asking who Tessie is. He then says that it's the two of them before pulling out a fan art style t-shirt of them. Jesse is surprised, saying that it's great. He then asks to see her phone and installs a new app, saying that it's perfect for couples like them. Jesse is fine with this at first until he adds that it's to track her wherever she goes. She then sarcastically asks why he doesn't just put a chip in her neck. Jesse, can I see your phone? Yeah. There's this great new app for couples like us. This way, I could track you wherever you go. <laughs> why don't you just put a chip in my neck? <laughs> 
So we're already starting off on a bit of a rocky start. Clearly they're trying to preface that Tony is being overbearing and Jesse isn't too sure about this. But part of me does also feel like this behavior is kind of coming out of nowhere, but I feel like we can just blame the sitcom format for that. Nonetheless, her stress continues later that day when we see Tony run up to her in the park. He then invites her to a special dinner at his family's Italian restaurant tomorrow night, excitedly adding that she can meet his parents. Jesse is nervous by this idea, stuttering over it and hyperventilating, but she does agree. Afterwards, she goes to Zuri and admits that Tony is an incredible guy, but first it was the t-shirt, then it was the couples app, and now meeting his parents, admitting that she might not be ready to take such a big step. Zuri tells her to relax and that it's not like he's asking her to move in with him. Then as if on cue, they're interrupted by Tony over the intercom asking Jesse to come with him to look at a place, adding that he wants to make sure she loves it before he takes that next step. She then gets nauseous, covering her mouth and leading to vomit. Now I feel like this is a bit of a new fun fact that we're learning about Jesse here, as she is clearly very scared of commitment. Or maybe just premature commitment, but either way I find it interesting considering the events that happen in the following season. Moving on, we then see Jesse and Tony at the apartment showing. Jesse asks if he's sure that he wants to go through with this as she thought that he loved living at home, but he admits that his mom has been giving him signs that she wants him out. He then brings her into a very small, very typical New York style apartment, at least from what I've seen on TikTok. Jesse is disgusted by it and he happily announces that it's only $2,000 a month. Jesse then goes over everything that's wrong with it. The lack of windows, the mold, the bed not being able to go all the way down, and the neighborhood being dangerous. But Tony has an excuse for everything that she brings up. She then slowly takes a step back, admitting that she thinks this is a bad idea. He reassures her that it's not and that he's been thinking a lot about his future lately, and now he's ready to start the next phase of his life. But he is the then unsure, asking if it's going to be weird with two people living there. Jesse is shocked, asking what he means by this, and is then triggered by claustrophobia as she feels the walls closing in. She heads for the door, asking if they can go, and he agrees, saying that they should get ready for dinner anyways. He admits that he can't wait for her to meet his folks and promises an unforgettable evening. Or is it gonna be weird when there's two people living here? T two people? Isn't this place small enough? And the walls seem to be closing in. Can we go? Yeah, we should get ready for dinner anyhow. I can't wait for you to meet my folks. Trust me, this is gonna be a night to remember. <laughs> So I know that in this moment, Jesse is panicking over the thought of living with him in this tiny apartment, but I don't know, I just felt like she could have been a little bit more respectful towards it. Tony just seemed to be so excited about this new chapter of his life, and then she was just an absolute downer about everything. <laughs> and honestly, I really don't think that his place was that bad, especially considering that it's an apartment in New York City. But again, I do understand that she was speaking out of fear here. So Jesse returns home from her visit with Tony, flopping on the couch and angrily stating men. She tells Zuri that she's pretty sure that Tony wants her to move in with him, and that she's meeting his parents tonight. She then recalls him saying that it's going to be a night to remember, asking Zuri if she thinks that he's going to propose. She then decides that just in case, she'll bring Zuri along with them. Her logic being that he would never ask her to marry him with a little kid hanging around. And then Zuri's overbearing friend, Stuart, ends up joining them as well. The paranoia continues at dinner when Zuri points out a photo of a little kid in a doorman uniform. He then earnestly hopes to pass on his epaulets to his son one day. Jesse then then panics and quickly changes the subject to dinner. Things then get worse when Tony's parents arrive and tell Jesse that they can call them mama and papa. She continues to panic before noticing pictures of proposals on the wall, and Tony explains that they're all relatives and that it's tradition to propose in the restaurant. And so she retorts that it's a tradition to never accept a proposal in a restaurant. Then we have the most wild comment of all as Tony's grandmother comes over. Jesse greets her with her mouth full and so she tells her that she eats like a toddler, but that she's able to overlook it because of her childbearing hips. This causes Jesse to immediately stand up and yell for the check, which I honestly don't even think was an over-exaggeration. If somebody made a comment like that to me about my body, basically alluding to the fact that its only use is for childbirth, I think I would have the same reaction, if not worse. Then while finishing off dessert, Jesse notices a ring on her fork. She immediately starts chanting no and gets up, backing away from the table. Tony then takes the fork and is confused, asking where the ring came from, and she tells him not to play coy that he's amazing and she really likes him, but if he thinks that this is happening, then he's insane. She says that she's extremely flattered, but that the answer is no and that she can't marry him. And then this is when Stuart interrupts, revealing that that was actually his ring that he got for Zuri. Maybe I could shed some light on this situation. Not now, Stuart. Okay. <laughs> Tony, what I'm saying is that I am extremely flattered, but no, my answer is no. 
I cannot marry you, Tony. What? Jesse, I really think you want to hear that. Stuart, grown up talk. <laughs> but that's my rank. Now again, I just find it really funny that this episode and plotline exists in general considering what's to come later on. But for the sake of spoilers for the people who haven't watched this show before, I'll just say that I feel like a lot can happen in a year. And Jessie does go on to say that she doesn't want to wait around for years and years. And I also feel like I have to mention that we're comparing two men with very different financial situations, which I feel like would be dishonest of us not to bring up, but that's all I'll say for now. Anyways, Tony is shocked asking Jessie why she thought that he was proposing. She repeats that he said that this would be a night to remember and that he wanted to share his apartment. But he explains that he said that because he knew that they would get a free meal and that he's rooming with his cousin. He then tells her that she's the greatest girl ever, but that he doesn't want to get married for years and years. She then does a 180 asking if she's just supposed to wait around for years and years in her Tessie t-shirt for him to make a commitment. And then Tony's dad chimes in, causing Jesse to get embarrassed over everybody hearing their argument. And then this conflict doesn't exactly get resolved. We just end the episode with Jesse banging her head against the elevator wall. And I think that I've said all I can about this episode while I was summarizing it, but I feel like it's safe to say that it's not exactly my favorite. I feel like it doesn't exactly paint Jesse in a good light, and it's always annoying when an episode's conflict could have easily been solved with some solid communication. But on to our next episode, which includes some more conflict. And honestly, this is just making me miss the simpler times of their story from the first season. And it is annoying that they couldn't come up with one positive storyline for the couple after they got together. So Jesse explains to Zuri that today is her one year anniversary with Tony and she has to finish her gift for him before their date. She's writing him a song and so the girls read what she has so far and then they go on to make fun of her for it because what she has so far is awful. Later while taking the kids to school, Tony enters calling her babe. She says that tonight is the big night and he agrees but says that it's the doorman bowling league championship. He asks her if she wants to come and she thinks that he's covering for a surprise and so she agrees. And then after he leaves, Zuri comments on him forgetting their anniversary. Jesse is in denial, saying that he's clearly playing dumb, but the kids aren't as convinced. That night, Jesse comes downstairs in a nice dress to a bowling shirt wearing Tony. He's in shock, saying that she looks great, but asks if she thinks she's a little bit done up for the bowling shack. And then Jesse is in shock that he's actually going bowling. He says that the pinheads need him and asks if she's coming. She sarcastically says no and that she's just going to wait in the lobby in her nice dress and makeup that took her an hour and a half to do. But don't you think that's a little dressy for the Hackensack Bowling Shack? <laughs> Wait, you're you're actually going bowling? Yeah, the pinheads need me. What? <laughs> Are you coming? No, no, I, I think I'll just hang out here in the lobby in my beautiful dress and full makeup, which took me an hour and a half to do. Okay, but it's 10 cent hot wings until nine. <laughs> so I feel like I should be upset about Tony not picking up what she's putting down here. But as we've gone over, Tony isn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. And Jesse isn't exactly great at communicating. And so I feel like this conflict is just perfectly curated for them. After Tony leaves, Jesse tells Emma that she can't believe he actually forgot their anniversary. She says that she just wants to bang her head against the wall and that he doesn't give her any respect at all. She then realizes that that wouldn't be a bad lyric and goes on to play a song that sounds much better than the one that she was writing earlier. The next day, the kids find Jessie on the couch eating ice cream, and Emma tells her to cheer up as she has some great news. We then find out that Emma and Zuri uploaded a video of her song online and everybody loves it. Her Tony diss song is a hit. Jessie is mad at first that she posted her pain online, but then forgives him after finding out that it went viral. Later that day, Tony comes up to their suite, happy to find her. He says that he's been calling her all day and asks why she hasn't answered. She retorts that just because he's a man doesn't mean that she has to be at his constant beck and call. And he says no, and then yes, admitting that he doesn't know what beck and call means. And then he wishes her a happy anniversary. She scoffs at him, telling him that he's a little late. And then he tells her that today is exactly one year since they kissed in the teacup. He then pulls out the citation that they got for trespassing, and we also find out that he's kept it all this time in his memory box. Jesse is shocked, admitting that she got the date wrong. She assumes that he's upset with her, but then he asks why he would be, saying that it would be crazy to be upset about something as little as that. She chuckles nervously, agreeing with him, and then he tells her that he has an awesome night planned. He got them tickets to an all-girl singer-songwriter showcase in Central Park. She hugs him, telling him that that's so thoughtful and not at all like the lyrics she wrote about him. Anyway, I have an awesome night planned. I got us tickets to this all-girl singer-songwriter showcase in Central Park called Estropalooza. Oh, Tony, that's so thoughtful. And not at all callous and mean like a love-killing machine. <laughs> 
so quite the pickle that our lead character has gotten herself into here. But also I just feel like it's such a classic Disney Channel mishap. Like I have a hard time taking this conflict seriously just because it feels so formulaic. But again, I just love how Tony doesn't seem to have a toxic masculine bone in his body. Him thinking that an all girl singer songwriter showcase would be the perfect event for the two of them is just everything to me. I mean, he could have been more so thinking about Jesse in this situation or they could have just used this as a way to like make the plot in this episode happen. But either way, I just love that. So that night while Jesse is getting ready for her date, Emma informs her that the director of the singer songwriter festival contacted her. And of course she wants Jesse to perform her Tony diss song tonight. She tells her that she can't as she's actually the one who forgot their anniversary. But Emma argues that this could be her big break. And so the girls end up planning to have Emma distract Tony while her and Zuri go to the festival. This way she can perform her song before he gets there. And again, I just feel like all of this is just so Disney Channel coded, like I can't even get mad at the deceitful behavior. At the event, Jessie tells Zuri that she's having second thoughts about bashing Tony in front of so many people and that the guilt is really starting to get to her. But then an audience member loudly calls her their hero and she goes to happily sign autographs and take photos. Zuri asks if that guilt is going away now and she says a little bit. And then of course, Tony arrives right in the middle of Jessie's performance. He is shocked and then overhears an audience member yell for her to make Tony pay for ripping her heart out. He at first thinks that they're referring to somebody else until he remembers that Tony is his name. Jesse then notices Tony in the crowd and stops mid-song, and then the same audience member calls him out as the guy who ditched her to go bowling. The crowd then begins hitting him with dolls of him that Zuri made. Jesse tries to get them to stop by saying that it wasn't like that before having to use feedback to get everyone's attention. She then announces to everybody that none of this is Tony's fault, that she's the one who got their anniversary wrong, and she's the one who overreacted and wrote a mean but catchy song about him. She then says that Tony is a wonderful guy and the audience begins to boo her. Jesse then apologizes to Tony for letting her ambition get the best of her and calls him an amazing boyfriend. That maybe it's not very poetic, but she does love him more than baloney. He then takes her hand, getting on stage with her and wiping away a tear saying that that was beautiful. And that baloney is the world's greatest processed meat product. She agrees and they hug before they have to run away from an angry crowd. You're an amazing boyfriend. <laughs> no such thing! And maybe it's not very poetic, but I really do love you more than baloney. <laughs> That's beautiful. And bologna is the world's greatest processed meat product. That's what I said. <laughs> so a sweet moment and a nice way to wrap up this episode. Though I do kind of feel like they gloss over Tony not really knowing the gravity of the song's success. But honestly, I doubt that he would even care that much. And also worth noting, I love how he picks her up and helps her off the stage as they leave. But now with everyone gone, we find the couple back where we left them. Tony sits in the audience as Jesse tells him that this was the song she wanted to write him. She then plays best year for him with callbacks to their previous moments accompanied by flashbacks. She also calls him up on stage with her and they dance together and we end with him giving her a kiss on the forehead. And I think all in all this actually ended up being my favorite Tessie episode from this season but also to be fair they didn't exactly give us much to work with. Especially considering the fact that now it is time for the couple to break up. Which does kind of make sense because all we've seen them really do in this season is fight but it's also just like not the best timing. Anyways we begin with Jesse telling telling Tony that she has a great idea of what they can do together on Saturday. He excitedly bets that they're thinking the same thing, but then at the same time that she says museum, he says go bowling. She says that as much as she loves going bowling with him, they went last weekend, but he argues that that's because the weekend before they went to the Met. She then asks if he wants to grab some lunch, but he says that he can't as he's stuck training some new doorman named Vic. A girl then walks in loudly announcing to Tony that it's her, his new doorman, and then hugs him. Tony is confused at first until she explains that she's an old friend. And then he tells her that he can still picture her in her Catholic school uniform. Jesse then butts in, telling him that he can stop doing that now. And Vic grabs Tony's arm, introducing herself to Jesse and saying that they go way back. Jesse then grabs his other arm, saying that they go out. They then continue pulling Tony back and forth as we cut to the theme song. Later that day, Jesse comes down while Tony is training Vic. He then asks her to go sort the mail to give the two of them some privacy. Vic then gets flirty as she's leaving, asking if she gets a paper cut if he'll kiss it better. He then looks confused in response to this as Vic walks off. Now alone, Tony tells Jesse that Vic is doing great and really fitting in, and Jesse makes a comment that what she's fitting into is her uniform and just 
sisters to her upper region. Which, like, I get that Jesse was jealous, but that was still, like, a super unnecessary and misogynistic comment for her to make. Anyways, this conversation is then cut short by Vic calling for Tony, and after he leaves, the girls ask Jesse if she's worried about this. She scoffs, saying of course not, and that she totally trusts him, but then says that they have to go to the park to pray, before quickly correcting herself to play. And now it is time for Jessie to make this situation even worse. So Emma asks her if she remembers a guy that she dated in high school named Ted. She says that she does, as he was the only guy that she ever dumped. Emma then explains that she found him online and that he's hot now and in town. And so she invited him over so that they can use him to make Tony jealous. Jessie says that that won't work unless he's changed a lot. And then Ted arrives and Jessie is in shock, announcing that he has changed a lot. She then makes a point of saying that they should go out to lunch through the lobby past the doorman. Now I know that you could argue that Emma is the one at fault here as she's the one who set all of this up, but what I think is important is that Jesse says that this plan isn't going to work, not because it's manipulative or immature, but because according to her memory, that guy's ugly. And then she immediately goes along with the plan when she sees that he's not. And so I feel like I would say that she's just as guilty here as Emma is. And so then we get to the two of them hanging out with their new quote unquote friends. Jesse complains to Ted about not being able to talk to Tony about fashion. He then leans in, noticing a ladybug on her shoulder. But Emma sabotages this moment by hitting Jesse with a soccer ball. Meanwhile, Tony worries that Ted might have better hair than him. Vic says no way, and that if she likes that guy more than him, then she's nuts as he's perfect. He retorts that Jesse doesn't think so, as she thinks that he spends too much time bowling. Vic is shocked by this, and then the two of them start bonding in Italian before Zuri interrupts. And then we have the couple's confrontation. So Tony delivers a package to Jesse by throwing it on the table and we hear it shatter. She asks him what's wrong and then he asks her how her lunch with GQ McCowboy was. She accuses him of being jealous, but he argues that he didn't have time to be jealous as he was having lunch with Vic, asking her what she thinks about that. She says that she thinks that Vic is a nice girl with a heart as big as her hair, and then it's Tony's turn to accuse her of being jealous. She argues that she's not that immature and that he can be friends with whoever he wants. He says that he will, and so she asks why they all can't be mature and have dinner together tonight. He agrees to this and then offers to host it at his place. <laughs> You're jealous. Oh, please, I'm not that immature. You can be friends with anyone you want. Thanks, I will. In fact, why don't we all be very mature and have dinner together, one big sophisticated group of friends. Fine by me, we'll have it at my place. I'll use the good china. You mean styrofoam? Yes, I mean styrofoam. <laughs> so although this whole season has just been filled with conflict between the couple, this is actually the first time that we've seen a real fight between the two of them. And I'm not exactly too sure what to think about it besides the fact that I do think that it was quite comical, which I guess is the point as the series is a comedy first and foremost. But I'm also not exactly too sure where that dinner suggestion came from or why Jessie thought that that was a good idea to suggest. Is that just her trying to rub Ted in his face again? Or did she just suggest it for a plot reason? reasons, I have no idea. Moving on to Tony's apartment, Vic compliments the place and Jesse makes a side comment about it being sketchy. This causes Tony to complain about Jesse never appreciating it. He then continues by wiping something off of Vic's chin while looking to Jesse as he does this. And so she goes to wipe something from Ted's face and pretends to cut herself on his cheekbones. Ted then takes it upon himself to state the obvious as he announces that something's wrong here. Tony asks why he would say that as there's nothing wrong with his girlfriend obsessing over his super model X, and Jesse then chimes in, adding or her boyfriend taking hours to show his beautiful protege how to open a door. This causes Tony to yell at Jesse for never understanding his work. He then asks to speak with her in the living room and the couple moves two feet away from everyone. So Tony asks Jesse why she's acting this way, but she argues that she's not, and if anything, he's the one acting in a way. This causes him to retort that if she doesn't like the way that he acts, then maybe she should go out with Ted. She is hurt by this, but says that maybe she should, adding that the two of them have a lot more in common than they do. She then says that if he thinks she doesn't understand him, then maybe he should go out with Vic. He yells done and then Vic cuts in. She reveals that she wanted to date him, but now that she sees how jealous he gets, he can forget about it. And Ted agrees saying that Jesse wasn't interested in what he looked like before. And she also dumped him by texting his mom. Ted and Vic then end up getting together and leave to go on a date themselves. And so now that Tony and Jesse are alone, despite Emma and Zuri, it's time for them to have a serious conversation. Tony asks her what they're doing as this isn't them. She agrees that it wasn't, but admits that things just haven't been the same lately. She then 
Nun asks if he's felt it too. He says that he has and that he used to love doing things that he hated with her. She agrees, but admits that she doesn't feel that way anymore. This causes her to conclude that their spark is gone and he agrees with her. She then confesses that she was attracted to Ted and asks if he hates her, but he says that he doesn't and if he's being honest, he felt something for Vic as well. And I'm just like, I'm not too sure those things are the same thing. Being attracted to someone and having feelings for someone are kind of two separate things, but that's just my opinion. Anyways, he asks what they do now, and she says that if they're noticing other people, then maybe it's a sign that they should see other people. She then asks if they're breaking up, and he assumes so, but says that he will always love her. She then says the same back, and they agree to always remain friends. So, are we breaking up? I guess so. And I will always love you. I'll always love you too. Friends, right? Absolutely. Friends, always. <laughs> So I feel like watching this breakup, like conflict aside, it's not exactly the best that we've seen. And you could argue that they're exaggerating or forcing it, but after reviewing everything that we've seen in this season, I really don't think that they are. I mean, they've done nothing but struggle ever since they got together. And this whole episode really exhibited some toxic behaviors on both sides. One thing I will say though, is I feel like them not enjoying doing what the other person likes after a while is kind of normal. But I guess that the point is that they were no longer to find happiness in just being with the other person doing those things. And so I guess that's valid. But now that the couple is Splitsville, it is time for season three. And before we get to the introduction of a new character, we do have a couple more plot lines between the couple while they are broken up. So in episode four, everybody comes home tired because Jesse has been forcing them to take the stairs since her breakup with Tony. Emma then says that things have been awkward between the couple ever since their breakup. And I do like that this brings us back to early season one when Jesse was worried about this exact thing happening. We later see Jesse attempting to sneak past Tony in the lobby, but then they end up seeing each other and awkwardly say one another's names. Jesse then asks why it has to be weird between the two of them. He argues that it hasn't been that long since they broke up and that it's natural for things to be a little weird until she moves on. And so she scoffs saying that she's already moved on probably farther than he has. He then asks how she knows how far he's moved and Jesse tells him that she'd be cool with him dating someone else. He says the same and so Jesse concludes that if they're both ready to date, then they should set each other up with dates for tomorrow night. Tony, along with everybody else, is confused by this proposition, but I'm honestly used to Jesse making weird suggestions at this point. Jesse then says that she is the perfect girl in mind for him. She says that she's beautiful, smart, fun, and a redhead, running off to get it set up. With Jesse gone, Tony then asks Zuri if she can believe that Jesse is throwing herself at him. He believes as though she just described herself, and so he concludes that he doesn't need to find her a date for tomorrow night. Zuri asks why she would do that when they broke up, but he argues that she's clearly still hung up on him. Moving on to date night, Jesse greets Tony and he asks if his quote unquote date is ready. She tells him that she thinks so as she's been waiting for him in that horse-drawn carriage over there for the past 10 minutes. Tony is then shocked to find out that she set him up on a real date and says that she's the most beautiful girl he's ever seen. Jesse makes a face in response to this and he quickly corrects himself adding that that's when he's not looking at her. Jesse then asks where her date is, and he stresses that maybe he's still in the lobby as he runs back inside. And one thing that I feel like is interesting about this scene and just this episode overall is that we never actually get to see this other girl. I'm not sure if that's because they didn't want to pay for another extra, or if that's because they didn't exactly know how to show what a girl who is prettier than Jesse looks like, according to Tony. And so instead, they just left it up to our imagination. But back in the lobby, Tony finds Earl the janitor, who he accidentally refers to as Eddie, or as he's better known as Tanner from Team Beach Movie. He calls him good looking and asks if he'll go out with his ex-girlfriend. Earl asks if she's cute and so he tells her to look for himself as he gestures to her through the doorway. Earl augas and then he strips off his overalls commenting on how happy he is that he wore something underneath them today. So it turns out that Jesse is not the only one that struggles with communication. I think that the better solution would have been to tell Jesse about the misunderstanding instead of setting her up on a date with a complete stranger. I feel like this is just such an irresponsible and not to mention dangerous thing to do, especially to a female. And I'm honestly surprised that Tony would be this careless with 
Jesse's well-being. So Tony introduces Earl to Jesse and gets his name wrong, referring to him as Eddie Earl. She asks how long he's known Tony from, and he answers honestly, saying about three minutes. Tony then fake laughs and calls him a joker and tells the two of them to have fun, as he knows that he will. And again, I don't love that Tony is just completely okay with leaving Jesse alone with a total stranger, as long as it means that he gets to go on a date with a hot girl. Moving on to Jesse's date, he ends up taking her to the Manhattan Zoo Gala, but not as guests. Instead, they're going there to hide behind the dumpsters and eat people's discarded food. And so Jesse is obviously very grossed out by this. Later, Zuri brings Tony to Jesse's date, and she asks him how he could set her up with somebody who eats trash. He argues that he didn't know that Earl did that, and then Jesse is confused as she thought that his name was Eddie Earl. And then Tony admits that he didn't even know his name. She asks him how he could do this to her when she set him up with somebody great, but he tries to argue that if she's so great, then why did she leave him in the middle of their date? And then Zuri is able to call him out on this as she told him that she got paid to the hospital for an emergency. And then Tony gets all cocky, saying that his date is a doctor. Jesse then just gets further upset with him as she says that she knows that as she actually knows her. How could you do this to me? I say you up with a great girl who eats new, purchased food. <laughs> if she's so great, then why did Valerie walk out on our date, huh? You said she got paid to the hospital for the emergency. Oh, yeah, that's right. She's a doctor, you know? <laughs> I know, because I know her. <laughs> And I mean, I think it's obvious that I'm Team Jesse on this one. I understand that Tony was just trying to cover for his mistake, but this really wasn't the right way to do it. And him still being focused on the girl that she set him up with during all of this doesn't help either. Anyways, chaos then ensues and a gorilla from the zoo gets loose, and this causes Jesse to get them all to hide in the dumpster. While inside, Jesse sarcastically thanks Tony for the best date ever, and then this is when Tony finally decides to come clean. He admits that the way that she described his date as beautiful, fun, smart, red hair, the perfect girl for him, that he thought it was her. She awes over him not being over her, calling it sweet, but admitting that she's not surprised. Beautiful, smart, red hair, the perfect girl for me? I thought it was you. Oh, Tony, you're not over me. That's so sweet, but I'm not surprised. You know what they say, once you leave Jesse, your heart's all depressy. <laughs> So I find it interesting that Jesse jumps to the conclusion that he's not over her yet, when really that's not exactly what happened. But then I guess him listing the characteristics earnestly is a way of him admitting that that is how he sees her, and then that's proof that he's not really over her. But at the same time, I still think that this whole episode kind of proves the opposite. I just feel like if he really cared for her, then he wouldn't have set her up with a complete stranger or been so excited to go out with this other girl, but... That's just me. Moving on to episode eight, Zuri compliments Tony on his new epaulets. He thanks her for noticing and then makes a side comment about at least somebody did. Jesse defends herself by saying that at least she noticed when he changed his hair gel, but he retorts that that's only because she borrowed it to fix the fender on Zuri's bike. He then compliments Zuri's power pony decals and says that he has the same ones. Jesse is shocked that he watches power ponies and him and Zuri break out into a power pony song and dance. And you guys already know what I'm gonna say, but again, I just love how comfortable Tony is in himself. And I honestly feel like it's a little bit refreshing to see a male lead depicted in this way, especially on Disney Channel at the time. But Jessie, on the other hand, doesn't exactly agree with me, as she has a very Carly Shay type of reaction to this, as she wishes that she could break up with him all over again. And I feel like I can't exactly get mad at this, as it's another thing that I feel like was very of its time, but I honestly just don't understand what's so frowned upon in regards to a guy having a stereotypical female interest. If anything, for me, I just feel like it would make him more attractive, but again, what do I know? That's actually it for this episode though, and so on to the next. In episode 17, Jesse signs up for a short film competition, and she is assigned love as her theme. And so she decides to recreate her love story with Tony for her short film, even casting him as himself. Zuri then asks her if she thinks Tony wants to recreate how they met and fell in love, even though she dumped him and stomped all over his heart. Jesse retorts that their breakup was mutual, but then agrees that she might be right, and that it might be a bit awkward for them to act out their whole relationship on camera. And so so this leads to her deciding to hold auditions for the part. But then while doing this, Tony just comes up and asks what's going on. She explains that she's making a movie about their relationship and all of these guys are auditioning to play him. And so then he asks why she didn't just ask him. She says that if he's okay with that, then she would love that. And he thanks her saying that he'll make a great him. Now, if this didn't already sound very similar to that one Austin and Allie episode, it's about to get even more similar. As Emma then suggests that their love story needs a twist. And then we go into this 
this imaginary sequence with them acting out their love story in a twilight fashion. Moving on, the gang then gets ready to shoot the scene where Jesse and Tony first meet. Jesse asks Tony if he's ready and he says that he is, but then when shooting starts, he keeps failing to get his line right. This leads Jesse to decide that they'll shoot the scene without him and she'll add him in in post. We then move on to a scene with the two of them in the park and Tony gets his lines wrong again. He then admits to her that reliving their relationship has left him a bit uncomfortable. And then lastly, we reach the scene where they have their first date and first kiss. Jesse stresses that she has to get this scene right and then Tony comes in wearing that same blue tux but it's two sizes too small now. This time while shooting the scene, the water effects don't go off and so Jesse decides to just skip to the kiss. Tony then interrupts her and she corrects him for not calling her by her character's name, but he says that he's talking to her. He then admits to her that he doesn't feel comfortable kissing her now that they've broken up. She tells him that it's just acting, that she knows that it's awkward, but that this movie is really important to her. He understands that, but says that he just can't. So she tells him to just think back to when they were in love and then yells at him to kiss her, calling him a greasy haired mook as she leans in. Tony panics and backs away, causing him to fall fall over and break the cardboard teacup. I just don't feel comfortable kissing you now that we're broken up. It's called acting! I know it's awkward, but this movie is really important to me. I understand, but I just can't. Just think back to how in love we were at this incredibly sweet, romantic moment. Now kiss me, a greasy-haired moke! Now I feel like this goes without saying, but you should not try to forcibly kiss your ex-boyfriend, especially not when he just told you how uncomfortable it would make him. And I feel like I've been highlighting the many times in which these characters failed to communicate, and so I have to give huge props to Tony here for perfectly communicating how he was feeling. And it's not his fault that Jesse just completely disregarded his feelings. Anyways, Tony apologizes to her and tells her that she'll have to finish her movie without him as it's just too weird. She yells at him to come back as this is the most important scene in the movie movie, but he's already gone. Later, after Jesse is able to see things more clearly, she concludes that the whole thing was a disaster, and realizes that she may have ruined her friendship with Tony. She then decides to rework the footage that she has and makes a movie about her love for the Ross children instead. A few days later, we see Tony give Jesse her mail as she enters the building. Things are awkward between the two of them until he says that he's sorry for quitting the movie and for letting her down, admitting again that it was awkward to play out those romantic scenes with his ex. She says that it's okay and that it was weird for her as well, then tells him that if it makes him feel any better, she was pretending that he was James Franco the entire time. I'm really sorry about quitting your movie and for letting you down. It, it was just awkward playing romantic scenes with my ex, you know? It's okay. It was weird for me too. If, if it makes you feel any better, I was pretending you were James Franco the whole time. <laughs> you mean during the filming or while we were dating? Let's not rehash the past. <laughs> And I don't know, I'm kind of just like, I don't think that Tony is the one that should be apologizing here. Last we saw of them, he was creating a clear boundary for her and she was just trying to bulldoze right past it. Which is also just so frustrating because I feel like it would have been so easy for her to just change that kiss into a stage kiss. I know that would have made for a much less dramatic moment, but it still would have been nice to see her accommodate for his feelings. Jessie is then excited as she notices that the letter that she's holding is from the festival. And then she opens it and finds out that her film was accepted. He congratulates her and they hug before they both step back awkwardly. And now I kind of wish that they could have used this moment to showcase that these two characters do still have feelings for each other. Like how great would it have been to see them both get caught up in the moment and pause to enjoy the hug? I just know I personally would have really enjoyed that a lot more than what we got. Anyways, he goes on to ask when filming starts for the sequel and she is confused as she thought that it was awkward for him to play her boyfriend. He scoffs at this saying that that doesn't matter now that the movie is a hit. She then tells him that he can be in it as long as he can remember one of his lines. And then of course he can't do this. And then that wraps up our episode. And that also wraps up our timeline. At least it puts them on a hold, I should say, as it is now time for the introduction of that new character I hinted at earlier. And so without further ado, it is time for us to meet Brooks. <laughs> So in episode 21, Jesse runs into a cute boy in the park. He reaches out to catch her on a runaway skateboard, but instead of saving her, they both end up falling to the ground. As they get up, Jesse is shocked by how cute he is. He asks if she's okay, but instead she answers her own question, saying that she's very single. He then asks if she lives around here, and she says that she does, but that she's originally from Texas. He loves Texas and says that his family owns a place out there. She asks if it's a vacation home, and he clarifies that he was referring to all of Houston. 
Houston. He then goes on to explain that it's family money and that it doesn't mean much to him, but it does mean that he can own his own nonprofit animal sanctuary. He then goes on to show her some photos of a baby giraffe that they rescued the previous week. They then joke about how cute giraffes are and how much they both love them, and Brooks says that they're almost as cute as her. Jesse stutters in response before noting that he's nice, good looking, and saves baby animals, saying that if she was his girlfriend, then she would lock him up in her basement. But their conversation is then cut short as the girls interrupt them. She thanks Brooks again for catching her, and he thanks her for being such a catch. Thanks again for catching me. Thanks for being such a catch. Okay, catch you later. <laughs> 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 okay, so definitely a much longer meet cute than we got between her and Tony, but it is kind of funny that they both met in a very similar way, with both times including Jesse falling to the ground and the guy coming to help her up. I guess that's just how you meet guys in the Jesse universe. But I also just have to talk about him bringing up the fact that he's rich within like the first five seconds of meeting her. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like if I came from money, that wouldn't be something that I'd just be like advertising to any stranger on the street. Mainly because I feel like I would worry about attracting the wrong type of people who would in turn only be interested in my money and not who I actually am as a person. And it's also not like he just came into it, like he's been raised with it, which I feel like makes him bringing it up so quickly that much more unrealistic and makes me question if he's only bringing it up to make her more interested in him. Like, you should go out with me because I'm rich type of thing. Like, it's almost like his pickup line. Which is funny because I feel like based off of her first look at him, I think it was pretty clear that he didn't need to do any of that and that she was already interested. But at the same time, I do understand that I'm probably looking way too much into it. And the real reason why he probably brought it up so fast was just that they could establish right off the bat that he comes from money. Anyways, back at home, Jesse stresses over not giving the cute guy in the park her phone number. And then, terrifyingly, Brooks just shows up in their suite stating that he finally found her. She asks him what he's doing there, and he says that he had to make sure that she was okay after her fall. And since she loves animals so much, he got her a get well soon racehorse. She asks the girls to give them a minute, and then while in private, she asks him how he knew where she lived. He explains that he couldn't find her in the phone book, and so he had a family friend do a little snooping. She asks if he's a detective, and he says sort of, as he explains that his family friend is the head of the CIA. He then says that the real reason he came over was to ask her out and invites her out to Chinese food the following night. She says that she would love to and they both turn away from each other to fist bump. Turning back, Jesse asks how he knew that Chinese food was her favorite and he admits that his friend at the CIA was pretty thorough before complimenting her dental records. He then tells her that he'll see her tomorrow and then kisses her on the cheek before leaving. Want to go for Chinese food tomorrow night? I would love to. So, how did you know Chinese food was my favorite? Our friend at the CIA was pretty thorough. Uh. By the way, amazing dental records. Thanks. I floss. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> So I don't know about you guys, but I just feel like that scene was just filled with so many red flags that I don't even know where to begin. Actually, I do know where to begin. Let's start with him stalking her and breaking into her home because that was actually insane. And the crazy part about all of this too is that he gets away with it only because he's hot and rich. Like if an ugly guy did all of this, I feel like Jesse would be like, oh no, I have a creepy stalker. And then it would have been like the joke of the episode. And then don't even get me started on like the CIA bit because just like talk about invasion of privacy. It would have been one thing if he only used it to find out where she lived, but to also find out her favorite food and then read her dental records is like actually crazy. And then it just annoys me that they're basically glorifying all of this behavior to the kids watching. It's almost like they're saying, this is what you want, this is romance, when I'm actually like, no, this is terrifying behavior actually. But anyways, after Jesse leaves, the girls start to panic. Emma notes that Jesse hasn't been this excited for a date since Tony, and Zuri agrees, saying that Tony is the one that she's supposed to be with, which you guys already know my thoughts on that. We then have a bit of a time jump to two weeks later. We see Brooks and Jesse having lunch together in the park, and he wishes her a happy two week anniversary. Emma and Zuri grumpily watch over them, and when he asks Emma for a napkin, she retorts that their doorman has better hair than him. And then we reach our couple's first hurdle as Mrs. Chesterfield interrupts. She refers to Brooks as a Brooksy and then tells him that they are missing a racehorse. And if you haven't guessed already, it is then revealed that Mrs. Chesterfield is actually Brooks's mother. There you are, Brooksy. I just got the oddest call from our stable. It seems we're missing a racehorse. Wait, Mrs. Chesterfield? Tessie? Mother? Mother? Ugh! 
So putting all of these stocking and whatnot aside, I actually like that they are putting some real effort into this ship. They're giving them something that they're going to have to work through together, instead of just making him like the other guy to Tony. And I honestly really like that, although I'm sure for some people it does have the opposite effect. So Mrs. Chesterfield asks why he's with Jesse and says that she's not good enough for him, and he retorts that maybe he likes girls who aren't good enough for him. He then quickly turns to Jesse, admitting that that came out wrong, and Mrs. Chesterfield tells him to trust her, as there are many things to despise about Jesse. He asks her to name one, and so she lists off that she is a nanny, has big feet, and that she can hear her snoring from downstairs. She then warns him not to defy her, as things can get very ugly for him if she doesn't get her way. We then move on to another date between the couple. Brooks sincerely tells Jesse that he wants her to know that his mother's threats don't scare him, that he really cares about her, and that she won't let her come between the two of them. They then lean in for a kiss, and as if on cue, they are interrupted by her. She then informs him that she cancelled his credit cards, and so no more fancy dates, no more fancy clothes, and no more money. Brooks tells her that she can't cut him off, that even she isn't that vicious, but she just retorts for him to ask his stepfathers if he can find them. Jesse then steps in and offers to pay their dinner bill until she sees the amount, but Brooks tells her not to worry as they can easily call some friends to lend them the money. But then he realizes that she's already cancelled his phone as well. I'm not too sure why they can't just use Jesse's phone and then problem solved but I guess they do sort of do this as Jesse calls Emma and Zuri for help. So the girls arrive, but refuse to help them pay for anything until Jesse breaks up with Brooks and gets back together with Tony. Will you lend us some money for dinner? Oh, Jesse, of course not. <laughs> what? Why not? Because you and Tony are perfect for each other, and we're not helping you until you dump this guy. So I feel like they might just be trying to remind us that we're still supposed to be rooting for Jesse and Tony here, but I do feel like it is having the opposite effect. Because instead, they're just pinning Jesse and Brooks against everybody. Which I feel like just makes you root for them instead, as it gives a very, like, them against the world sort of situation. But what do I know? Maybe the girls were just supposed to represent those fans that are still rooting for Jesse and Tony throughout all of this? Or that was just supposed to be part of the conflict of this episode, and they needed a reason as to why Emma and Zuri wouldn't help her. Anyways, the couple then tries numerous ways to pay off their bill. Brooks tries to give the waiter his watch in exchange, and Jesse tries to sneak out the bathroom window to get some money, but ends up falling in the toilet. In the end, Brooks tells Jesse that this is ridiculous, and that he's just going to be a man and ask his mom to pay for dinner. This is when Jesse admits that she's just not worried about paying for only this meal, but all of the ones that are going to come after it, suggesting that maybe it's better that he break up with her. He says no, and then she questions if he's really ready to give up his entire life lifestyle. All of his money and everything for a girl that he just met. He asks if she means the girl who was willing to fall into a toilet for him, who loves animals as much as he does, and makes him melt when she looks into his eyes. He then says that maybe this will answer her question as he dramatically walks over to his mom. He tells her that he's had it, that he's sick of her controlling him, and that he doesn't need her money. He then admits that he's had a better time with Jesse these past two weeks than he's ever had in his life. He then tells her that she can keep it all, because he'd rather be poor and happy with Jesse than rich and without her. Jesse says that that is the most wonderful thing that a guy has ever said about her, and Emma says that for the last time they want her to be with Tony. Jesse says that it's not about what makes them happy, it's what makes the two of them happy. Brooks agrees, saying that they'll stay in the restaurant forever if they have to. And then the waiter comes to save the day as he says that he'll cover it, mainly so that he can get the two of them to leave, but then he also takes Brooks's watch. And we will stay in this restaurant forever if we have to. No! Oh, no, you won't. <laughs> you people have caused enough commotion. And you're covered in toilet water. <laughs> I will pay your bill. Thank you. I'll pay you back. Your absence will be payment enough. <laughs> Plus, I'll take that watch. <laughs> So Mrs. Chesterfield says that they may have won the battle, but the war is far from over. And once they're all gone, Brooks admits that he doesn't know how they'll get home. Jesse suggests that they take the subway, and he agrees, admitting that he's always wanted to. He then gets a bit scared by this idea and asks to hold her hand, which she obviously agrees to. So kind of a nice metaphor to what they're stepping into together in their relationship as well. And despite some hiccups, I would say that this isn't a bad first episode for the ship. While I am also a lover of an it's always been them trope, I 
unlike Emma and Zuri, do enjoy other stories as well. And I think having these two characters come together in a very Romeo and Juliet style does make for a good story. I wouldn't say that they're my favorite ship, and I do still think that season one Tessie have them beat, but this was a really good episode. They clearly put some thought into their story and their relationship, and it's crazy as to just how much happens in the very first episode that we see them together. And so if you do prefer these two over Jesse and Tony, I can definitely see why. Moving on to the following episode, though, where Tony really gets thrown into the mix. We begin with Jesse and Brooks returning from a date. He thanks her for winning herself a giant stuffed zebra and compliments her throw. And then his mother comes out of the building and interrupts the two of them. She tells him that her offer still stands, he can dump Jesse and then get his fortune back, but he yells back that he's not dumping her. Jesse then jokes about how sad it is that she's the one with money, and he retorts that he does have money but ends up pulling out a button from his pocket. The couple then enters the lobby and Jesse explains Brooks' situation to Tony. She asks if there's any openings in the building and then suggests that he become the new elevator operator. Tony says that it's possible, but first he has to get through the interview process. So he has Brooks step into his office, which is of course the two chairs in front of them. He asks if he's ever been in an elevator and Brooks says that he has. He then asks if he got to the floor he wanted to and Brooks says almost always. That's good enough for Tony and so he hires him on the spot. Jesse congratulates him and calls him babe and they hug before she says that things are finally looking up. Good enough for me, you're hired. <laughs> Oh, congratulations, <laughs> babe. Things are finally looking up. Or should I say, going up. So I like all of this. I like that Tony is being super respectful in regards to Jesse's new relationship. Even going out of his way to help them out, I feel like is very mature of him. Now Jesse going to her ex-boyfriend to help her new boyfriend, I feel like is a little bit questionable, but Tony seems okay with it, so I feel like I can't complain. The girls, on the other hand, still feel otherwise. They ask Tony if it bothers him that Brooks is dating Jesse, and he says not really, as him and Jesse are just friends. But Zuri yells back that they're soulmates and that he never should have let her go. He says that that's sweet, but that they're wrong, and the girls argue that they're right before running off to school. Later that day, Jesse asks Brooks how the new job is going. He says good, and that he wants her to know how much he appreciates everything she's doing for him. They hug, and she says that she thinks that the worst is behind them. Then again, as if on cue, the elevator opens up to his mother. She is in shock that he is working there, and according to her, has sunk this low. And Jesse argues that if she wouldn't have taken all of his money away, then he wouldn't need this job. This causes Mrs. Chesterfield to go to Bertram for help in breaking apart Jesse and Brooks. And then she asks him to get some dirt on Jesse. Moving on to another Jesse and Brooks date. We see Brooks scarfing down some food and Jesse notes that he must have been really hungry. He apologizes but admits that he hasn't had any money to buy food today. So she pulls out a full-size turkey for him to eat before asking if he misses the animal sanctuary. He says that he does and that they just saved an endangered toad who spits acid. She jokes that some things are maybe better extinct but he assures her that she would have loved him as he was one of a kind. This causes Jesse to get upset over all of this being her fault, that she's the reason that he's lost his mother, his money, and his deadly toad. He then grabs her hands and tells her that it's not her fault, it's his mother's, and that it doesn't matter anyways as she's worth it. He then tells her that he loves her. She says it back and that she just wants him to be as happy as he's made her, and he assures her that he will as soon as he gets used to this new job. It's not your fault. My mother's. And anyway, you're worth it. Jesse, I love you. Oh, Brooks, I love you too. I just want you to be as happy as you've made me. And I will be once I get used to this new job. So two episodes in and already having an I love you moment is kind of insane. But at the same time, I also understand that we've done a lot of time jumps in their story so far, and these two have truly been through a lot together, and so I'm sure that that has strengthened their bond as well. Though I do still feel like all of this is happening quite quickly, especially when you compare it to that slow burn that we got with Tessie and the fact that we never even got an I love you scene like this between them. Anyways, this scene is then followed up with a romantic montage. We see them slow dancing to a violin player, going into the elevator where Jesse presses the emergency stop button. This causes the sprinklers to go off and they kiss under them. They also have hot chocolate on the terrace and she wipes the whipped cream from his face. They then lean in for another kiss but are interrupted by Luke. And all of this is very sweet. It almost gives me Mason and Alex vibes from Wizards, not just because of the romantic montage but also because of their take on the rain kiss. Though I can't ignore the similarities to Jesse and Tony's first kiss which also happened after they were were covered in water. The 
the next day, Brooks arrives with a bouquet of flowers. Tony tells him that he didn't have to, and he apologizes, explaining that they're for Jesse. He says that she's so awesome, and he just doesn't understand how he could have let her go. Tony then admits that he's been getting that a lot lately, and then this is when we start to see a real shift in Tony as he starts to realize that maybe Emma and Zuri were right. And I really hope that this is just a case of him finally accepting how he's felt all along, and not just him only wanting her now that she's happy with someone else. But I feel like it's safe for us to assume that it is the first one, because thanks to some episodes that we got before Brooks was introduced, we do know that he wasn't over her before then. So Tony tells Zuri and Emma that they were right and that he might still have feelings for Jesse. He asks them what he should do and they tell him to tell her how he feels. He then stresses that it might be too late as she's totally in love with Brooks, but Zuri says that he can't let her end up with him as he's just a pretty boy in a uniform. And then Tony is hurt by this as they just described him as well. Which they just love doing. They love commenting on his uniform, I must say. But meanwhile, Jesse finds out that Mrs. Chesterfield asked Bertram to get some dirt on her. This causes her to admit that she thought that eventually she would agree to let Brooks have his old life back. But then she concludes that that woman will stop at nothing to get what she wants. Bertram asks why this matters as they seem so happy and love and Brooks seems okay with his new life. Jesse agrees, but says for now, asking what will happen in a year or two, as she's worried that he's just gonna end up resenting her and that she can't live with that. And so she decides that she's just going to have to let him go as it's what's best for him. What about in a year? Five years? Or 10 years? I mean, he, he's just gonna end up resenting me. I can't let that happen. So, what are you saying? I'm saying I have to love him enough to let him go. Now, I really liked this moment. I didn't realize how great of a friendship Jesse and Bertram had until my rewatch. And now I just appreciate it that much more and moments like this. And I also totally understand where Jesse is coming from. It's just unfortunate because I do feel like it kind of gives off the vibe that she was only interested in him when he did have money, which I know obviously wasn't the case, but her breaking up with him now, I feel like would give off that connotation. And so this conversation then leads to Bertram deciding to get some dirt on Mrs. Chesterfield instead. And then once he gets it, he uses it to blackmail Mrs. Chesterfield. She retorts that she knows what's best for her son, which is why she left him penniless, but he argues that she only showed him that Jesse loves him for who he is and not what he has. And if anything, she just brought them closer together. He then suggests that because she's only ever married for money and not love, that she can't recognize real love when she sees it. And once again, I just love all of this. Like, go Bertram, he has got to be one of the best and also most underrated characters on this show. But moving on to Jesse and Brooks's almost breakup. So that night, Jesse tells Brooks that she wants him to know that she's had an amazing few months with him. That every minute that he's been in her life has been incredible, which is what makes this next part so difficult to say. He tells her that he loves her and that whatever it is, they can get through it together. Which kind of makes me melt, but also question if that's what their whole relationship is built on. Like, I wonder if the events that go on to happen didn't happen, and how long they would have actually gone on to last if it was no longer them against the rest of the world. They really haven't been together without this conflict going on around them, and so I feel like if it was up to me, I don't think they would last that long, but what do I know? And so Jessie says that she loves him too, which is why she needs to do this. She then says that they need to break before they are interrupted by Mrs. Chesterfield. So she says that they need to talk. She then apologizes to the both of them, gives Brooks his money back, and gives him back his job at the animal sanctuary. She reveals that her talk with Bertram made her realize that Jessie might be the only woman in the world who loves him as much as she does. They share a group hug and Brooks thanks his mom, saying that her blessing means more to him than money. He then asks asks Jesse what it was that she needed to tell him. She then covers for herself, saying that they need to break dance. She then goes on to dance, and he concludes that that must have been why she was so upset earlier, as she's a terrible break dancer. And although all of this wraps up the episode quite nicely, we're not exactly over quite yet. Later, Jesse arrives home and greets Tony, beaming over everything being perfect with her and Brooks. Tony then runs into the elevator to ride it up with her. She thanks him again for helping Brooks, as she knows that it must have been weird to have have her ex-boyfriend helping out her current boyfriend. He says that it's not a problem as weird requests are his specialty and that it looks like her and Brooks have gotten pretty serious. She confirms that they are and then he admits that he's been thinking about her a lot lately. And I'm kind of like, I don't know, maybe time and place? She literally just said that things are going great with her boyfriend. I'm not too sure that this is the right time for Tony to confess his feelings to her, but I guess he's never really been the brightest. I don't know. But that's the thing though, like he's never really been the brightest when it comes to trivial things 
things, but I feel like his emotional intelligence is quite high, so I really don't get why he segues into his feelings here. But anyways, he says that he has to tell her something before it's too late, and then goes to say that he's still in love with her. But then they arrive at the penthouse. The living room is lit up with candles, and we see a path of rose petals leading to a very well-dressed Brooks. Jesse walks over to him, and he tells her that there's something he wants to ask her. He says that she's the most amazing girl that he's ever met, that she loves him for who he is, makes him a better person, and makes him happy. She stresses that this is usually the part that's followed up with a but, but he says no buts, that he realizes now that there will never be a girl more perfect for him. And since he's lucky enough to have finally found the girl of his dreams, he sees no reason to wait. We then cut to a sad-faced Tony who closes the elevator door, shaking his head as Brooks gets down on one knee. He then asks Jesse if she will make him the happiest man alive and marry him. And since I am lucky enough to have found the girl of my dreams, I see no reason to wait. <sighs> wow! Is that a diamond ring or a disco ball? <laughs> Jesse Prescott, will you make me the happiest man in the whole world and marry me? So I know that Debbie Ryan is trying to make Disney Channel history here, but again, I feel like all of this is kind of insane. First of all, it brings me right back to that episode in season two where Jesse panicked over the thought of Tony proposing to her. I know that a lot of time has passed and we're dealing with two very different men in two very different positions, but I still feel like the existence of that episode in comparison to this one is quite ironic. Again, there is also the fact that this is still the second episode that we've seen between the couple and he's already proposing. And then that just makes me feel like it's kind of giving doomed from the start. Like in what world am I actually supposed to believe that this couple is endgame if you only ever gave them two episodes of screen time? I mean, they have been two very good episodes where the couple has been driving the story, but I still feel like that is just such a short amount of time. And then I also feel like he is rushing into things after his mother like just gave them her blessing. I feel like it's safe to say that he definitely should have waited a few more months before proposing and doing it the exact same day that he received his mother's blessing, I feel like is kind of insane. But nonetheless, Brooks has proposed and this is actually our cliffhanger of the episode and so let's move on to part two. So picking up right where we left off, Brooks asks Jesse what she thinks. She says that this is amazing and then he asks if that's a yes or a no. She admits that this is all very sudden and so he asks if that's a no. She says no and that it's just amazingly sudden and suddenly amazing. She then asks if she's babbling and he says a little but that she's really cute while doing it and she ends up telling him that she's flattered and thrilled but that they've only known one another for a few months. He then says that it's okay and that he understands that this is a big decision. And so if she needs some time to think it over, and then she says that some time would be perfect. They then kiss and share I love yous before he leaves. Hey, it's okay. I know it's a huge decision. So if you need some time to think it over. Yeah, some time. Perfect, thank you. Great, I'll be back in five minutes. What is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh. I love you. I love you too. So I like this a lot more. I feel like this is much more fitting to Jessie's character. She's definitely not freaking out as much as she was at the thought of Tony proposing, but she is still admitting to it all being very sudden and needing some time to think about it. Though I feel like if your girlfriend asks for some time in response to your proposal, then maybe you shouldn't be proposing. I know a lot of people like the element of surprise, but I do feel like a proposal should be something that's discussed between the couples so that you don't have situations like this. But moving on, we then see Jessie go to Bertram to talk about this, which once again, I just love them and their relationship. She tells him that Brooks proposed and he congratulates her, then asks if she's told the kids yet. Jesse says that she can't as they're so anti Brooks, that she loves him so much, but she told him that she needs more time to decide. Bertram agrees that it's a very important decision, then asks her if she's sure that he's the right guy. She says, of course, other than the kids not liking him and his mother hating her. The next day we see Jesse, Brooks, and the kids at the park. While left alone, Brooks asks asks Jessie if she's made a decision yet. She says that she still doesn't know as they're both so young. Apparently she's 22 and he's 25, which just makes so much sense. I mean, I just turned 26 and I do feel like I am ready to get married, but I did not feel that way at 22. Although to be fair, I also wasn't in a relationship at 22, so maybe I would have felt differently if that was the case. Anyways, Brooks agrees, but says that they're both animal lovers. And so they're like 115 in dog years. She then tells him that she just wants to make sure that they've considered 
considered everything, and that she wishes that him and the kids got along better. He asks what she means as the kids love him right as they hit him with a soccer ball. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong because oftentimes when I do these videos, I only watch the episodes needed for the story that I'm covering. It's all kind of like depending on how much time that I have to make the video. But I feel like I just don't remember Jesse being that much of an animal lover. Brooks has brought this up a few times throughout this relationship where he's like, we're both animal lovers, we're both perfect for each other. And I'm just like, are you though? I know everybody kind of loves animals for the most part, but like when I'm thinking about Jesse, I'm not like, oh, and she loves animals. Like that's definitely not something that comes across my mind. But anyways, this is the Halloween episode because they simply love those on Jesse. And so back at home, Brooks praises Emma on her pumpkin carving. She then tells him that it took forever right as he accidentally drops it. He then checks in on Ravi, who is watching a girl from school's hamster. Ravi then asks him to watch over him for a second. And then of course, under his watch, the hamster freezes. Thinking that he killed him, Ravi yells at Brooks, calling him a monster who killed his hamster and his only shot at love. Then we get to the Halloween festival where Brooks drags Luke into the haunted house. Luke is terrified as he hates haunted houses and he runs out screaming. He apologizes saying that he had no idea that he would get so scared that he'd puke. He then asks if there's anything he can do to make it up to him, but Luke tells him that he ruined Halloween enough already for all of them and asks him to leave. Jesse then comes over asking what's going on and what they did to him. The kids then argue that they didn't do anything, that he made Luke throw up, destroyed Emma's pumpkin, and killed Ravi's hamster. And since he didn't do anything to Zuri, she adds that she's supposed to be with Tony. And so Jesse retorts that Tony isn't the one who proposed, Brooks is. The kids are then shocked by this news, asking if she's going to say yes. Jesse says maybe that she doesn't know and that it's complicated. That she really wants all of them to like him, but meanwhile, she's struggling over whether or not she should say yes. And so now it is time for Brooks to win over all of the kids. He starts with Luke and draws his attention to the girls over there. He tells them that they wanted to go in the haunted house as well, but are too scared. He then suggests that since he already knows when they scare you in there, then he can be the strong shoulder for them to lean on. He thanks him for this and then runs off to be with the girls. Emma then comes in, thanking him for helping her win the pumpkin contest, as she reveals that she used his face as inspiration. She then apologizes for the fangs that she included, admitting that she didn't like him that much until he won her jewelry. And then lastly, he asks to see Ravi's hamster, and then after holding him for a bit, he is able to wake him. He explains that he called up a vet from the sanctuary and found out that the hamster might have been hibernating. The fact that he didn't know that already, being the one who owns and also works at the sanctuary, I found to be a little bit questionable, but I'll let it slide. Meanwhile, Jessie stresses to Bertram about not knowing whether or not Brooks is the perfect guy. She then confesses that her perfect guy would get along with the kids better, would have Tony's hair, Channing Tatum's dance moves, and the soul of a poet. She then goes into a Frankenstein-style dream sequence where we have Ravi creating her the perfect man. She is then able to learn through Dream Zuri that there is no such thing as the perfect guy. This causes her to realize what her answer for Brooks is as she runs off to find him. Back at the festival, Jessie calls all of the kids over as she has something to say to Brooks that she wants them to hear. She tells him that all her life she's had this image in her head as to what the perfect guy is and admits that she's been looking for him in all the wrong places. But what is important is that she finally found him. She confesses that she's realized that he's not the perfect guy because there is no such thing. But what he is is the perfect guy for her. She knows that he might have made a mess trying to win over the kids today, but what she loves is how hard he tried. The kids then cut in explaining what she missed and how he was able to fix everything. And so Jesse decides to ask Zuri's opinion. And so Zuri concludes that he makes her happy and he made Luke vomit. And so she owes him. Brooks then gets down on one knee asking Jesse if she's saying what he hopes she's saying. She then says yes and that she would love to marry him. So, are you saying what I hope you're saying? I'm saying, yes, I would love to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> So as adorable as this moment is, I kind of hate that it's happening during the Halloween episode. But Frankenstein costumes aside, I do enjoy this moment and the fact that the kids are included in it. As obviously their relationship with Jesse is what the show is all about, and so that just makes this moment even better. On to the following episode, Jesse gushes to Emma over her engagement ring. Emma then starts analyzing it, but Jesse tells her that it's not about the ring, that it's special to her because it shows her how much Brooks loves her. Zuri then asks if after they're married, Brooks will bunk with 
with Bertram, and Jesse has to break it to her that her and Brooks will probably get their own place. Later that day, Jesse asks Emma and Zuri if they'll be her bridesmaids, and Brooks asks Luke and Ravi if they'll be his groomsmen. Mrs. Chesterfield then comes in announcing that she booked Madison Square Garden for their wedding. Jesse then makes it clear that she does not want that, and so she asks her that she at least wear her dress from her fourth wedding. She then takes Jesse away to try on the dress, and she returns in a very hideous over-the-top number. Brooks then sarcastically celebrates Jesse looking so much like his mother and then comments on how much therapy he's going to need. Moving on, we then see Jesse ask Tony what he's doing October the following year. He's not too sure, and so she asks him to save the date for her and Brooks's wedding. He asks her if that would be awkward as the two of them used to date and he let her use his bowling ball, and then she touches his arm saying that they'll always have that, but that it would mean the world to her if he was there as he's such an important person to her in her life. He then says that he would be honored to attend her wedding and puts his hand on her shoulder, quoting his grandmother in Italian. She compliments what he says and asks what it means, and he jokes, put me down for chicken, I'm watching my figure. Then, I'd be honored to attend your wedding. No. <laughs> As my grandma always said, cantame, parapolo, sto attento alla linea. Oh, Tony, that's beautiful. What does it mean? Put me down for chicken. I'm watching my figure. Okay, so I know that this show is a comedy first and foremost, but how amazing would it have been if he told her that he always loved her or something like that while he was speaking in Italian? He could have easily lied to her about what it meant and then confessed later what it really meant. I mean, I just feel like that would have been perfect, and I do wonder if something like that was in an earlier draft of the script. And then this is a question that I wanted to ask you guys, because I've never really remained friends with any of my exes and neither has my significant other. And so I'm just like, is it normal to invite an ex of yours to your wedding? especially when that ex is as recent as Tony is. I feel like I kind of understand where Jesse is coming from, but I also feel like if I was Tony, I wouldn't go just out of respect for her and her new relationship, and also because I feel like it would just be too hard on him, especially because he already confessed that he's not over her. But anyways, back upstairs, Brooks arrives with some amazing news for Jesse. He just got the opportunity to run a new wildlife refugee. Jesse says that that's incredible and that she's so proud of him, but then he explains that to get the job, he would have to be in Africa in two days. Jesse is unsure, but then he grabs her hands, expressing his excitement. She nervously agrees that it's definitely something that they have to talk about in the kitchen as she pulls him away to talk in private. While in the kitchen, Jesse panics as she squeezes Brooks's hand, asking if he's really going to Africa in two days. He then pulls his hands out of her grip as he explains that he's not the only one going, as obviously his wife will go with him, explaining further that he wants the two of them to get married before they go. She is then shocked that he expects her to give up her whole life and move to Africa with him in two days, and then asks about the kids as she was still planning on being their nanny after they got married. He tells her that that he knows that she loves them, but asks if she was really planning on being their nanny forever. She assumes not, but that she at least wanted to get Luke through high school first, and he expresses that this is the chance in a lifetime for him, and so she agrees. They kiss before she admits that she has no idea how she's going to tell the kids, but then it turns out that she doesn't have to as they were actually listening into their conversation. Justin, this is the chance of a lifetime for me, but it won't mean anything without you. Please, please come with me. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> So I feel like this conflict kind of reminds me of the Miggy fallout from Liv and Maddie. And for me, the annoyance mainly comes down to the idea of one half of the couple making a decision that obviously affects the both of them. I feel like it was super inconsiderate of Brooks to basically tell Jesse that she's going with him without discussing it with her first. And then I also just feel like it shows how well he doesn't know her. When I think about Jesse and the things that are important to her, the two things that come to mind for me are the kids and her dream of being an actress. Her packing up everything and moving to Africa with him would get in the way of both of those things. And then I also kind of feel like his comment about her not wanting to be a nanny forever was a little bit condescending. And then it also gives the impression that he's speaking from his privilege and that he sees her job as being disposable, which is honestly something that just really gave me a bad impression as to who he is as a person. But now that their wedding has been bumped up, that means that their other festivities have been bumped up as well. So Zuri and Emma throw Jesse a bachelorette picnic in the park. And on the other side of things, Luke and Rob 
Javi have a bachelor party for Brooks that includes laser tag with real lasers. They then threaten him with the lasers before Jesse interrupts. She scolds them for this and admits that she knows that this is hard for them, but she had hoped that they would find it in their hearts to be happy for her before she runs off upset. After she's gone, Bertram tells the kids that he's disappointed in them and that when she walks down the aisle tomorrow, he needs to know that they love and support her. And then this causes the kids to go up to Jesse's room and apologize. They confess that they're just mad at Brooks for taking her away from them, and she admits that she doesn't want to lose them either. But the kids, of course, conclude that if marrying Brooks is what she wants, then they support her. And since things are going so quickly, it is now time for their wedding day. So we see Jesse getting ready when Tony comes in. He has his eyes covered and starts bumping into things until Jesse asks why he's covering his eyes. He asks if it's not bad luck for an ex to see their ex on their wedding day, but she says that it's not and pulls his hands from his eyes. She smiles at him and he lets a woe slip as he tells her that she looks amazing. Jesse then gets a call that the reverend isn't going to make it. She then stresses about having no one to perform the ceremony and Tony sighs before saying that he'll marry her. She then explains that first, she's already married and second, he really has to work on his proposal skills. He then clarifies that he meant that he will marry her and Brooks as he has his license to perform wedding ceremonies. And so he says that if it's not too weird, he can officiate her wedding. She says that that would be incredible and he tells her that he has to go put on his formal epaulets. But first, what he came for, which is to give her her gift. He explains that it's the program and menu from her improv debut that he got framed. She notices that he put a star next to her name and she asks if that was because she was his favorite. He then earnestly says absolutely and she says that this is incredible. She then thanks him and they share a hug. Their hug lasts for a little bit longer than it should and they linger as they pull back before snapping themselves out of it. He then says that he's going to get changed and they shake hands before he leaves, stumbling on his way out. Tony, this is incredibly thoughtful. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, um, uh... well. So I feel like it's safe to say that that one look is maybe more romantically charged than anything we've seen between Jesse and Brooks. And I kind of wish that we could have gotten to see more of this Tessie earlier on in the season. But I'll take what I can get, and part of me does feel like what makes this moment so good is because of the circumstance that they're in. But besides that, there are also just so many layers to that gift that he got her. I mean, first of all, the fact that he kept that menu to begin with is adorable. Even when back during that episode, he was upset with her and he still kept it. But I think for me personally, the most special part about it is that it just shows how well Tony knows her. He knows about her dream of being an actress and how important it is to her, which is more than I can say about Brooks. Like, has he ever even acknowledged her hopes and dreams? I don't think he has. It's always been all about him. Moving on to the ceremony, we see Tony in a very monotone fashion. Call it a happy, happy day as the kids burst into tears. Then when asking Brooks if he promises to love and cherish her, he turns it into a threat, saying that if he doesn't, he'll hunt him down in Africa as he grabs him by the collar. He then asks Jesse the same question, but adds on no backsies, even if he's a bad bowler. Jesse then goes on to say, I do, before looking over at the kids and to Tony who nods, but then she says that she doesn't. She apologizes, but says that she just can't before running off. We then see Brooks go after her and he finds her in her room. He asks if she's okay and what happened. She apologizes and admits that she thought that she was ready for this, but it's marriage and moving to Africa. He admits that it's a lot and that he knows that, but that they're doing it together. She retorts that they're doing it so fast and she doesn't know if she's ready to be a part of a couple as she's barely been a single. She feels as though she still has so much to learn about who she is before she can share herself with someone else. He then asks if this is about Tony and she says, no, of course not, and then says maybe a little. He then turns to leave, but she calls for him saying that it's more than that. She then gets him to sit down and confesses that she moved to New York to become an actress and she's just not ready yet to give up on that dream. He tells her that he doesn't want her to and that once they get settled in Africa, she can continue pursuing her dream of acting, but she asks how she would do that as there's not exactly many opportunities in Africa. 
Erica. He then asks her if she had all of these doubts, then why did she say yes? And of course, she explains that she said yes because she loves him. Because he came, swept her off her feet, and it felt like a dream come true. But then when she looked at the kids, she realized that she's just not ready yet to leave them. And then he gets up, stressing about the endangered warthog needing him. And that if he wants to do his part to save them, then he's got to go to Africa without her. She says that she understands that he has to follow his dream too, and he concludes that their dreams are taking them in different directions. She then gives him his ring back and he takes it. She confesses that she's going to miss him so much, and he says the same before they hug goodbye. We then have some deja vu as he tells her that she should probably tell the kids, and she nods before opening the door, realizing that they were listening into them once again. I'm gonna miss you so much. I'm gonna miss you too. So first off, I mean, I just love being right. I think a big part of Jessie's story is the fact that she moved to New York to pursue this dream and her giving up on that just wouldn't feel right. And I love that they use that here because I do think that it is a valid reason to call off the wedding. If these were normal circumstances, I think that this is a conversation that would have been happening before they decided to get married. But I think that that just goes to show why you really shouldn't rush into things, especially not things as big as marriage. I also liked that Tony was brought into the conversation, but I don't like how quickly she dismissed him. I understand that her calling off the wedding was about more than just Tony, but selfishly, I would have liked to see her confess here that she did have lingering feelings for him. I mean, I guess that we can confirm that based off of their interaction earlier, but it still would have been nice to hear her actually say it. Overall, I did really enjoy this conversation. I think that it depicted a very healthy breakup, which is honestly refreshing in terms of Disney Channel breakups. And I do think that it offered a good conclusion to their story. That being said though, their story actually isn't over quite yet, as we have one more episode that features the couple. So now we've reached season four, which is actually our last season of the series. And we start off the first episode with a bang. So Emma asks Jessie if she's heard from Brooke since their wedding day. She says that she hasn't, but would be happy to. Then as if on cue, her phone beeps with a message from Brooks. Jessie then panics in response to this, throwing her phone across the table and breaking it. Later that day, Jessie confesses to Bertram that she feels bad for Brooks as being dumped is no picnic. She then tells him that the email that he sent her was very sad, but then Bertram reads it out loud and all it says is that Africa is nice and that he hopes all is well with her. She argues that he needs to read between the lines, but he says that there is only one line and so there's nothing to read between. Nonetheless, Jessie concludes that she obviously needs to apologize to him again. She feels as though sending an email though would be too impersonal and that she needs to talk with him. She then leaves asking Bertram to watch the kids while she's gone. Moving on, Emma asks the other kids if they've seen Jessie as she's been gone on for quite some time. Bertram then explains what she told him, and then they all jump to the conclusion that Jesse went to Africa to be with Brooks. And then later, Jesse comes home to a sleeping Bertram with a note on his face. It explains that they have all gone to Africa to stop Jesse from leaving them. And so now Jesse and Bertram have to travel to Africa to bring them home. Meanwhile, the kids have made it to Africa and found Brooks. And I would make a joke about this being like such a difficult task for a bunch of kids to accomplish, but this isn't exactly the first time we've seen them do something like this. Anyways, the kids ask him where Jesse is and he says that he doesn't know as he stopped keeping tabs on her when she said I don't instead of I do. He then asks why Jesse would come here and Zuri says that it's because she's still in love with him. Brooks is shocked by this news and then unsure what to do with the kids, he takes them on a tour. Then back at the sanctuary, Jesse arrives. She finds Zuri and scolds the kids for running away and Zuri says that it was an emergency as they thought that she was leaving them for Brooks. Jesse explains that she's not getting back together with him. And then Brooke's friend, Cammy introduces herself. Jessie is surprised that she recognizes her until she explains that it's because of all the pictures of her Brooks put up. Jessie asks if he put up photos of her to remember her by, but then she admits that they're actually to throw darts at, which I was kind of surprised by. Like, I know that this is a joke, but I really wouldn't have pegged Brooks as being like a vengeful guy. But then I guess he was like a creepy stalker in the beginning, so maybe this does check out. Jessie then interprets this as him still being heartbroken and Cammy goes to say something, but then she interrupts her. Moving on, Cammy then takes Jesse and Zuri to the rest of the kids and Brooks. The couple greets one another and Jesse jokes that he probably thought that he would never see her face again. And Zuri cuts in saying, unless there's darts sticking out of it. She then says that she understands and that she left him on their wedding day. And so it makes sense that he's still heartbroken. He admits that he's really not and Emma tries to cut in, but Jesse tells her that she's trying to let Brooks down easy. 
again. He tells her to trust him and that he's over her, but she consoles him by saying that denial isn't just a river. He then asks that they talk about this later so that he can finish the rhino fence that he's working on. I left you on our wedding day. Of course you're still heartbroken. No, I'm really not. Uh, Jesse, I need to tell you something. Not now, I'm, I'm trying to let Brooks down gently. Again. <laughs> Jesse, trust me, I'm over you. Oh, Brooks, Brooks, Brooks. Denial isn't just the river Bertram peed in on the way over here. Of course, shenanigans then ensue and the team has to rush out of there before being attacked by the wild animals. Brooks asks his sweetheart to get everybody in the truck and Jesse thinks that he's referring to her and this causes her to announce that he's clearly still in love with her. He then finally confesses that he was talking to Cammy as she's his girlfriend. Jesse is then confused as she asks how he could move on so quickly after their wedding, which is honestly pretty valid. Like they weren't just dating, they were going to get married and he's already dating someone else. Like that's kind of crazy. But I guess one thing we do know about this guy is that he does move quite fast. Brooks does have a pretty solid comeback as he retorts that she moved on during their wedding. And I must admit that that might be my favorite line ever. Jesse then asks why he sent her a love note then. And he is confused asking if she's referring to the email where he said that he hoped all is well. She says again that she read between the lines and he makes the same argument that there is only one line. And he also reveals that he sent the exact same email to a bunch of people. Later, while they're alone, Jesse tells Brooks that he could have warned her that he has a girlfriend, and he retorts that she could have warned him that she was coming to visit. She argues that she didn't come to visit, that she came to get the kids, and says that she can't believe that she was worried that he was devastated. He says that he's not, and she agrees that they've established that. And honestly, I think so far in this episode, I have to be Team Brooks. Like, he's got some pretty great comebacks here, and I definitely think he uh, maybe has the upper hand on Jesse in this one. Then, of course, some more shenanigans ensue, and the gang then has to outrun a rhino. Cammy says that they need to pull a Jesse, and so she asks what that means. Brooke explains that it's to suddenly run away, and Jesse is upset to find out that the two of them have an inside joke about her. Cammy then argues that he can have whatever he wants, as she's the one who left him, and then he encourages her to stick it to her. Jesse then asks if Brooks has ever given her one of his neck massages. She says sometimes, and so she tells her to thank her, as she's the one who taught him that. Obviously, they all survive being chased by the rhino, and I assume that this is a little bit of a bonding moment for them. As back at the sanctuary, Cammy tells her that it must be a shock that she's dating her ex-fiance, but she hopes that they can still be friends. Jesse says, of course, before asking if she's met Brooks's mother yet. She says no, and so Jesse laughs, wishing her luck. Cammy then wishes her a safe trip back before leaving the two of them alone. Brooks tells Jesse that it was really nice to see her, and she agrees as it gave her another chance to say how sorry she is for running out on their wedding. He tells her that it's okay and that it all worked out for the best as he found his soulmate in Africa, which I just have to question him a little bit on as he thought that Jesse was his soulmate like five minutes ago. Sure, we don't know how much time has passed, but I really don't think it's been that long. So who knows if him and Cammy really do end up together, but it is nice to see that he moved on. Later on, Zuri asks Jesse if she's okay, and she says that she is and that she's really happy for him and Cammy. Now, although I feel like this entire episode is a little bit unnecessary, at the same time, I do feel like it was a really fun one, so I feel like I can't complain. I also like how they were able to bring a character back that did play a pretty prominent role for a good chunk of episodes, and so it is really cool to see firsthand where this character does end up. But now that we have truly wrapped up Jesse and Brooks's storyline, it is time to get back to our end game, and also move on to our final chapter of this video. Okay, so now that we've closed the Brooks chapter, you might be thinking that there couldn't possibly be anything else that we could squeeze out of that plot line, but unfortunately, you'd be wrong. So in episode two, Tony comes to help Jesse return all of her wedding presents. He struggles with one of them being heavy, and Ravi jokes that not everyone is kind enough to get her a used takeout menu. He gives Tony his gift back, and he snatches it, emphasizing that it's a used takeout menu in a frame. He then tells her that he heard it's okay to keep one gift and hopes that she'll choose this one. She says, of course, but then jokes about keeping her towel warmer as well. That's a used takeout menu in a frame. And it's still my favorite present. I've heard it's okay to keep one wedding gift. I hope you'll choose this one. Oh, of course I will. 
But this was really more of a pre-wedding gesture, so the towel warmer stinks. <laughs> So I really like that we're starting out the episode this way, because they're reminding us of that special gift that he got her and that previous moment that they shared. Moving on, Jessie's enemy turned stepsister arrives and she doesn't know that her and Brooks didn't get married. So Darla accuses Jessie of making Brooks up, and so then when Tony enters, Jessie pretends that he's Brooks. She announces that here comes her hunky husband, introducing him as Brooks and leaning her head on his shoulder. We later see Jessie and Tony bringing Darla up to the penthouse. Their arms are linked and Jessie tries to encourage Darla to stay somewhere else. She tells her that she could stay at the budget hut on Queens instead, and then Tony chimes in saying that that place is really nice as they wash their sheets after every guest. Jesse then has to remind him that he is Brooks, her rich, perfect husband who would never stay there. And then this causes Tony to ask if she's okay. She says that she is and that she's just nuts about him, calling him Brooks once again. She then asks Ravi to show Darla to the guest rooms so that her and Tony can have a moment alone. Once they are, he asks Jesse if they're rehearsing a weird play that he doesn't know about, and she she explains that she doesn't want Darla to know that she didn't get married, asking him to pretend to be Brooks until she leaves. He tells her that he doesn't know how to fake being a rich guy, but she says that that's nothing that he can't learn and gets Emma to teach him. And this is where I feel like I just have to remind us all of an episode that we got in the previous season, where we saw that Tony isn't exactly an actor and he struggles even when it comes to just playing himself. He also made it very clear in that episode that he wouldn't feel comfortable playing Jesse's boyfriend after they broke up. And yet here she is making him do so once again. And so yeah, all of this together on top of all the lying and deceit that this involves, I feel like this is just a recipe for disaster. Later that day, Jesse finds a very wet Tony and she tells him that they have to go to dinner with Darla in an hour. She then asks what's going on and Emma shows her that she's been spraying Tony with a spray bottle every time he got a question wrong. Jesse tells her that that's mean and that he's just doing his best, but then when she asks him what his most valuable painting in his collection is and he says dogs playing poker, she sprays him with water herself. Hey, that's mean. He's doing his best. Hey, let me try. Brooks, what is the most valuable painting in your collection? I don't know. Dogs playing poker? <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if I'm being dramatic here, maybe I am, but I just hate the way that Tony like flinches in fear at the thought of him getting the answer wrong again. And I feel like it's one thing for Emma to be treating him this way, but Jesse, when like she's the one who's supposed to be caring for him and looking out for him, like it's just a bad look if you ask me. I know once again that this show is a comedy, but still I just didn't love the connotations that this scene gave. Moving on to their dinner, Darla makes a comment about Jesse coming from a long line of carnival workers, and Tony sticks up for her by saying that he's proud that they're five kids are going to be part Carney. He then names all of them, including one named Tony Jr., before Jesse clears her throat and he corrects himself to Brooks Jr. Emma then interrupts, asking quote unquote Brooks about his time at Harvard. Darla asks if he liked his time there and he says that it was the best two years of his life. Jesse then mumbles that he got that one wrong as well and he tries to correct himself, but unfortunately he doesn't know how long an undergrad takes. Ravi then interrupts and he takes Jesse away and they talk for a bit until Darla interrupts, announcing that Jesse married the perfect guy. She tells her that she loves them both and hugs her before she runs off. Jesse then praises Tony and says that whatever he did, he's a genius. And he reveals that all he did was offer her a job at his airline. Jesse then gets upset, telling him that he can't do that, but he argues that he can as he owns the company. She then has to remind him that Brooks owns the company and he's not Brooks, and then he gets upset with her wishing that she'd make up her mind. Jesse then rhetorically asks where a spray bottle is when you need one, and Emma jumps in by using the water attachment from the cart to spray him instead. Which again, I'm just like, I don't love this. I feel like it's really unfair to Tony and it's not his fault that he was roped into doing this. And it's not even like they asked him beforehand if he was okay with it. Like Jesse is basically forcing him to do this, which I feel like just makes the whole situation even worse. Back at home, Darla tells Jessie that she doesn't seem too excited about her new job. Jessie goes to tell her the truth, but says instead that Brooks is a terrible boss and she can't work for him. Darla is shocked, saying that he seems like an absolute angel. Tony thanks her pointedly for this, but Jessie says that he's not. That he has a terrible memory, a lousy taste in art, and can't follow simple instructions. Tony then retorts that she can be very ungrateful, even when someone is doing a huge favor for them. And Darla says that she's always been self Selfish, even going as far as to accuse her of falling into a well as a kid for attention. Jesse then goes to attack her for this comment and Tony has to hold her back. So now annoyed, Jesse tells Darla that she can't work for him. Darla asks her how cruel she can be and notes to Tony that she hopes he got a prenup. 
Then at this point, Jessie has had enough. She asks herself why she's always trying to impress her and why she's so worried about what she thinks, before telling her the truth that her and Brooks didn't get married. Darla then turns around, asking Tony if that means that he's still available, and she has to explain that he's not Brooks, he's Tony. She tells her that she was engaged to a billionaire named Brooks, but she called it off last minute, and she didn't want to tell her the truth because she knew that she would rub her nose in it. In the end, Tony apologizes to Jesse for messing up her plan and admits that he's not a very good actor. But Jesse says, that he's the sweetest, most understanding ex-boyfriend that a girl could have. She admits that she never should have asked him to play someone else and that he's perfect just the way he is. They then share a hug and that is how we wrap up the episode. What I see is the sweetest, most understanding ex-boyfriend any girl could ever have. And I should never have asked you to be someone else. You're perfect just the way you are. All right, so now I feel like we're back on the right track. I feel like that apology Jessie gave to Tony was very well deserved, if you can even call it an apology because she didn't actually say those words, but I do interpret it as such. And with that, we can finally wipe our hands clean of all of this Brooke stuff as he is basically irrelevant from this point on. And complaints aside, I actually did really enjoy this episode. I'm honestly just a sucker for a fake dating scenario, as I'm sure you guys know by now. And I do think that it did a good job of bridging that gap from the Brooke stuff and back to the Jesse and Tony stuff. And there isn't much ship content in the following episode, but Tony is in it. Basically, the Ross children lose all of their money, and so Tony steps in to help. He brings them pizza, and Jesse thanks him for the free meal, and he tells her that they can have pizza from his family's restaurant every night until they get back on their feet. She later confides in him that the Rosses can no longer afford to pay her, and so she has to get a second job, and then he hires her as the building's handyman. And honestly, at this point, I feel like Tony just like deserves a reward for the amount of jobs that he's handed out when Jesse's been in need. But then to top it all off, after they lose their apartment, Tony lets them stay at his. So even though this episode wasn't about them specifically, it does show just how much Tony does care about her, and all the sacrifices that he is willing to make for her. And now we jump forward to episode 18, which is when the couple gets back together. And I do feel like, although a lot of time has passed, this does still feel kind of quick. I wish we could have seen more of a Jesse and Tony slow burn back to one another in this season. Instead of just giving us one episode of them in the beginning of the season, and then not seeing them again until the very end. So of course this happens during the Halloween episode. Jessie has a dream where she meets a masked stranger in the park. He was wearing a cape, a mask kissed her hand, and gave her a rose. So she's decided to go to the Central Park Masquerade Ball as she thinks that that is the perfect place to meet the man of her dreams. Later we see Jessie run into Tony in the lobby. He asks what she's carrying and she explains that it's her gown for the Masquerade Ball. She says that she has to look good as she never knows who she might meet there, and then gives him a friendly punch to the arm. She goes to leave, but he stops her, asking to talk. She jokes that she's heard those words before and that he can't break up with her as he's already her ex. But he says that that's just it and that he wants to be her ex ex-boyfriend, meaning that he wants them to get back together. Jesse is shocked, admitting that she does still really care about him, but feels as though their spark is gone as they already know everything about each other. He argues that that might not be the case and uses his parents as an example. She then tells him that he's a great guy, but that she's looking for someone who has dreams as big as her own. He argues that he does have big dreams, but she retorts that bowling a 280 is not a big dream. My parents have been married 30 years, and Ma just found out about Dad's extra belly button. <laughs> so that's why you wouldn't go to the beach with us. <laughs> anyway, look, you are a great guy, but maybe I'm just looking for someone whose dreams are as big as mine. I have big dreams. Oh, Tony, sweetie, bowling a 280 is not a big dream. So a couple things. First off, I kind of wish that like the moment where this idea was proposed would have been like more of a moment, if that makes sense. Instead of him just like asking if they could get back together, I just wish it could have been more of a thing, which I guess is how the episode plays out. But even just with this being the reveal to Jesse that that's what Tony wants, I feel like it was a bit lackluster. And then I also didn't appreciate Jesse jumping to the conclusion that Tony isn't ambitious. But I guess that that's the whole point of the episode, and so let's continue on. So we've now reached the master ball, and we see a man who is dressed in the same disguise as Jesse's dream man greets her at the party. She connects everything together and tells him that he might be the man of her dreams, and he tells her that he hopes so as she's the most stunning girl that he's ever seen. She goes to introduce herself, but he tells her no names yet, not until they unmask at midnight. She tells him that this is incredible and that the last time a guy swept her off her feet in the park, it was an out-of-control rollerblader. Hi, my name is- Oh, no names yet. Not until we unmask at midnight. Oh. 
Well, this is incredible. The last time a guy swept me off my feet in the park, it was an out-of-control rollerblader. So I apologize for the slight spoilers if you haven't seen this episode already, but I kind of have to spoil it a little bit to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, but basically that mystery man is Tony. And so I'm just like, okay, since when is Tony a good actor? Like every other time we've seen Tony act in this show, he's been a consistent mess. But now suddenly he's a pro who can like change his voice and everything. I mean, maybe he's able to act when it's on his own terms, or this is their way of showing like just how much Jesse means to him. Like he's able to put himself out of his comfort zone and really like win her back. But I do still feel like the inconsistency of this does bug me a little bit because I'm like, where did this side of Tony come from? Anyways, we later see them dancing and Tony states how romantic it is that it's just the two of them. She asks him what he does for a living and he reveals that he just got into the firefighter academy. And then she is impressed that he is going to be a firefighter. And I really like this reveal. I love finding out that Tony really does have bigger ambitions than just being a doorman. And I like that it shows that Jesse really just needed to take the time to listen to him. The kids then interrupt their dance, and Jesse tells them that she has to go, but promises to be back there before midnight. Meanwhile, Luke, Ravi, and Emma go missing. Tony then comes in running, saying that he came as soon as he could. Jesse explains to him that the kids have been taken by a ghost girl to a parallel dimension, and Tony is on board right away asking what the quickest way to the spirit world is, which I just absolutely love, and then she thanks him for being there. He says, of course, and that it's her, and then they share a look before they are interrupted by some diabolical laugh. After. Okay, this is gonna be a little bit hard to believe, but I think some of the kids may have been taken by a ghost girl to a play date in a parallel dimension. Got it. What's the fastest way to the spirit world? Bridge, tunnel, or seance? <laughs> Thank you for being here, Tony. Well, of course, it's you. So first of all, I just absolutely love that Tony is the first person that Jesse calls when she's worried about the kids. And then I just love how quick he is to change out of his disguise and be there for her. And then I also love that they share a moment here because I feel like at this point, we're not really supposed to know that Tony is the masked stranger. And so maybe they were trying to create a love triangle with that. And then it's just the perfect scenario where he's both options. But then I also love it because it shows that they do still have that strong connection, even when it is just the two of them. Anyways, they do end up finding the kids in a hospital haunted house thanks to Tony's suggestion. And they also find out that all of this was just an elaborate invite to Stuart's Halloween party. Jesse is mad that he's made her miss the unmasking of the man of her dreams, but then he argues that she wasn't actually invited. She then goes to attack him for this comment and Tony has to hold her back. Afterwards, Jesse is still upset that she missed her mystery man's unmasking. And then they suggest that he could still be there waiting for her. And so she runs back to the party to find out. Back at the ball, Jesse arrives and it's completely empty. A disguised Tony then emerges stating that she came back. She's surprised that he waited for her and he says, of course. He then says that he waited longer than she knows, taking off his mask and revealing himself to her. Jesse is shocked that it was him all along and asks why he didn't just tell her who he was. He explains that he wanted her to see him in a different light and she says that he succeeded. She then asks if he's really joining the fire academy and he says that he is and that it's been a dream of his ever since he was little. She thinks that that's amazing and then she apologizes, saying that it was wrong for her to assume that he didn't have big dreams as well. He concludes that they still have a lot to learn about each other and she agrees. He then asks her if their spark is still there and she admits that it could burn down the whole park. They hug and then he pulls out a rose, revealing that he wanted to give it to her at midnight. She then lists off everything, asking which one of the kids told him about her dream. He is then confused, asking what dream. And she says, never mind, admitting that some dreams really do come true. He agrees that his just did and they hug before heading home. I wanted to give this to you at midnight. Okay, wait, the red rose, the mask, the black cape. Which one of the kids told you about my dream? What dream? Never mind. I guess sometimes dreams really do come true after all. Mine just did. All right, so if this is like their big moment, like this is the ship that they've been teasing ever since episode one, why can't they kiss? Like I know that Disney can be a bit iffy when it comes to kiss scenes, but I feel like one was definitely warranted here, especially because this is supposed to be like their big moment. And then I feel like having them hug instead just kind of leaves the scene to feel a little bit more awkward. And it's also not like we haven't seen them kiss before. Like I know it's been a couple of seasons, but still I feel like they should have kissed here and I'm mad that they didn't. But lack of a kiss aside, I do really like this scene 
and just this whole plot line from this episode in general. I feel like it was very sweet and it was a great way to get them back together. But all of this actually brings us to our finale, in which they undo all of that wonderful character development that was just given to Tony, so get ready for that. So Christina, the kids' mother, comes home. This causes a bit of jealousy between her and Jesse as the kids keep going to Jesse for things instead of her. Jesse tells Tony about this, but then we find out that he has some problems of his own, as Mrs. Chesterfield is planning on remodeling the lobby to include automatic doors, which of course would diminish the need for his job. Which I found kind of interesting because I do think that Tony did more than just be a doorman. Like he was delivering packages, he was the guy at the desk. Like I think that he was more than just the doorman, but I digress. Anyways, Christina ends up getting Jesse a part in a movie. The shoot is in LA and she has to leave tomorrow for two weeks. Then while on shoot for this movie, Jesse ends up getting a role in her own series. And so now she has to move to LA permanently to be able to do it. But throughout all of this, Tony is never seen or mentioned other than their one conversation earlier. Which I do understand kind of similarly to their first episode of the season, in that this show isn't really about their relationship, the main focus is between Jesse and the kids. But I do wonder if there maybe was going to be a conversation between Jesse and Tony in there that just ended up getting cut for time. Either way, I do feel like it is quite annoying that they literally just got them back together and now he's not even a part of this conversation whatsoever. But then we get to the part that really bugs me. So Tony surprises Jesse on set. She asks him what he's doing there and he explains that he works there. That he had to drop out of the fire academy because he was allergic to smoke, even though everybody is. He then says that he heard that there were a lot of big doors out in LA and so here he is. She says that she's so glad and then he wishes her luck on the first day of the rest of her life. I had to drop out of the fire academy. It turns out I'm allergic to smoke. Isn't everybody? Yeah, but I actually puked on the Dalmatian. <laughs> Anywho, I heard it had a lot of big doors out here in LA, so here I am. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> well, good luck on the first day of the rest of your life, you big star. <sighs> Thanks, Tony. So just like, oh my god, I don't even know where to begin. First of all, I hate that they gave Tony all of these big dreams just to undo it a few episodes later. I guess you could argue that him working on a film set is his new dream, but then I also feel like they allude to his new job just being him opening doors again. And then again, I also hate the connotations that they didn't communicate at all in regards to any of this. But I guess a lack of communication would check out in regards to what we saw previously from their relationship. But jokes aside, did Jesse really not talk to Tony about her move to LA at all? Like, it just seems so weird. If he didn't make that firefighter comment, I would almost assume that this episode came before the other one, or they weren't aware of, like, that being how they ended their relationship or something. I don't know. It's just really weird and feels rushed. I just feel like it would have been so much better if they could have shown that this decision was going to be hard on Jessie, not just because it meant her leaving the kids, but also because it meant that she would have to leave Tony, who she just got back together with. I mean, I'm sure, like, hypothetically speaking, a conversation with Tony did happen, and it probably ended ended with him wishing her well and wanting her to go after her dreams. It just sucks that we didn't get to see that. And then of course it also sucks that Tony doesn't get to follow his dreams because Jesse is pursuing hers. I feel like it would have been so easy to have him go with Jesse and give us like one line where it says that like he's gonna go train to be a firefighter in LA instead. I feel like that would have been a simple solution that also wouldn't undo all of his previous character development. And while this finale just bugs me so much for feeling just so rushed and unsatisfying, I feel like it probably mainly came down to them just not having enough runtime for the finale. I really just don't understand why Jesse wasn't given a two-parter for its series finale, especially when it was one of the top shows on the network at the time. And I really do think that if they were given a two-parter, it probably would have solved everything that I'm sitting here complaining about. But yeah, that's basically it. We have reached the end of Jesse and Tony's love story. And I am just so glad that I ended up doing this video because I know so many of you are just begging for it. And I'm honestly just really curious to read the comments on this one because I I have no idea as to what like the general consensus on this ship is. I feel like I am just so far removed from the Jesse fandom that I was truly going into this with a complete blind eye. But I think that my overall thoughts, just to wrap everything up, would be that they were fun in the first season. Their conflicts and their breakup in the second season was quite annoying to watch. And then Brooks just had way too much screen time in the third. Like I feel like that chapter took me almost as long as all of the Jesse and Tony stuff. And then I also just feel like we really didn't get the ending that we deserved with them in that 
fourth season. I feel like you could watch that last episode and not even know if they were together or not because I definitely didn't. But as I said, I want to know your guys' thoughts on them, so please leave them in the comments down below. I can't wait to read all about it. Also, as always, please let me know what ship you'd like to see me cover next. But with all that being said, that is all from me. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you very, very soon. I'm also not exactly too sure as to why these lights are like twinkling like this. I'm sorry if it's annoying. They're not like that, like to the blind eye. Like I can see that they're doing that in the camera, but when I just stare at them, they're static. So I don't know if it's something with like the, the, the neon light I have that's making it react that way. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just a girl. <laughs>